Chapter One of All in the Day's Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chufi Galeazzi, Rohnert Park, California. All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. Chapter One My Start in Life. If it had not been for the panic of 1857 and the long depression which followed it, I should have been born in Taylor County, Iowa. That is what my father and mother had planned. In fact, however, I was born in a log house in Erie County, Pennsylvania, on November 5, 1857. It was the home of my pioneering maternal grandfather, Walter Raleigh McCullough. No home in which I have ever lived has left me with pleasanter memories of itself. It was a Cape Cod house, a story and a half high, built of matched hewn logs, its floors of narrow fitted oak planks, its walls sealed, its upstairs finished, a big fireplace in its living room. There were spreading frame outbuildings to accommodate the multiple activities of a farm which, in my time, was a going concern. I remember best the big cool milk room with its dozens of filled pans on the racks its huge wooden bowl heaped with yellow butter on its way to the firkin, its baskets piled with eggs, its plump dressed poultry ready for market. Like all young married people of pioneer ancestry and experience having their way to make, my parents wanted land. Land of their own, combined with what my father could earn at his profession as a teacher and his trade as a joiner, meant future security. It was the proved way of the early American. After much looking about in northwestern Pennsylvania, where the families of both were settled, they had decided that the West offered greater opportunity, and so, in the spring of 1857, a year after his marriage, my father, Franklin Sumner Tarbell by name, started out to find a farm. He had but little money in his pocket, and the last 150 miles of his search were made on foot. How enthusiastic he was over the claim he at last secured! His letters tell of the splendid dome of sky which covered it, of the far view over the prairie, of marvellous flowers and birds, of the daily passing along the horizon of a stream of covered wagons, settlers bound for California, Pikes Peak, Kansas, Nebraska and some of them, he found, were earlier Iowa settlers, leaving the very state which for the moment seemed to him the gate to paradise. He set himself gaily at breaking land, building the house for mother, working in a sawmill to pay for the lumber. He did it alone, even to the making of window frames and doors. I know how he did it, whistling from morning till night, mischief and tenderness chasing each other across his blue eyes as he thought of my mother's coming, their future together. The plan they had made provided for her going west with their household goods in August. The money was arranged for, so they thought, but before it was taken from the bank the panic came, and every county bank in Pennsylvania was closed. There was no money anywhere nothing for my mother to do but stay where she was while my father struggled to earn by teaching and carpenter work the money which would bring us on but the panic reached iowa drying up its money supply people were living by barter my father reported what a heartbreaking waiting it was for them coming as it did after an engagement of six years every week of which they had both found long the fall and winter of eighteen fifty seven the spring and summer of 1858 passed. Still there was no money to be had. And then, in the fall of 1858, father started out to teach his way to us. Before he found a school, he had walked 180 miles, walked until his shoes and clothes were worn and tattered. It was shabby and broke, as he had written it would be, that he finally, in the spring of 1859, when I was a year and a half old, made his way back to my mother, still living in the log house in Erie County. According to the family annals, I deeply resented the intimacy between the strange man and my mother, so far my exclusive possession. Flinging my arms about my mother, so the story went, I cried, Go away, bad man! 
the problem for my father now was to earn money to take us back to iowa for my mother to continue her patient waiting for a dozen years before her marriage she had taught in district schools in erie county as well as in a private school of an aunt in poughkeepsie new york she was a good teacher but she was married she must stay with her family then until her husband had a home ready for her so ruled my grandmother chock full as she was of the best and severest new england rules for training girls to be ladies you might live in a log house you were reminded loftily that many of the best families had done that while settling the country but you must never forget who you are remember that your father is a mccullough of an ancient and honored scotch clan his mother a raleigh of sir walter's family that i am a seabury my great-uncle the first episcopal bishop in the united states my mother a wells her father on washington's staff it was a litany her four daughters all had to learn exciting employment waited my father for six or seven years before his marriage when he was earning his way through the academy of jamestown new york he spent his summers running a fleet of three or more flatboats of merchandise to be delivered at trading points on the allegheny and the ohio river always as far south as louisville sometimes even up the mississippi captain tarbell his small and jolly crew called him the river was the chief highway of a great country to its waters came the pioneer and trader the teacher the preacher the scientist the prophet as well as every species of gambler charlatan speculator swindler cutthroat my father's stories of what he saw were among the joys of my childhood a great fleet of steamboats burning at pittsburgh a hanging river churches and preachers and showboats children who never knew other homes than a boat towns cities and what he loved best of all nights floating quietly down the great ohio the moon above not strange that after those cruel months of working his way back to us he should have seized this opportunity again to take charge of his jamestown friends river enterprise the trip went well and at the end of august eighteen fifty nine he turned back money in his pocket to take us to iowa but as he journeyed eastward he was met everywhere by excitement a man had drilled a well near a lumber settlement in northwestern pennsylvania titusville it was called drilled for oil and found it quantities of it my father like most men who traveled up and down the allegheny and ohio in those days was familiar with crude petroleum he had used it to grease creaking machinery and too as a medicine a general cure-all seneca oil used it for the colds the fever and ague the weak lungs which had afflicted him from boyhood he knew too that there were those who believed that if rock oil as it was called could be found in sufficient quantities it would make a better light than the coal and whale oils then in common use the well near titusville producing twenty-five to one hundred barrels a day nobody knew how much proved that if other reservoirs or veins could be opened by such drilling there would be oil to light the world rumors were exciting and grew in the telling the nearer he came to erie county the bigger the well he met men on foot and horseback making their way in something to look into before he started back to iowa he looked into it not merely at titusville with its first well but down the stream on which the first well stood and where other wells were already drilling oil creek it was called what if they continued to get oil my father asked himself where would they put it they would need tanks tanks in numbers he believed he could build one that would hold five hundred or more barrels he said as much to the owner of a well drilling down the creek near the mouth of a tributary called cherry run show me a model that won't leak and i'll give you an order he lost no time in making his model and got his order here was a chance for a business if oil continued to be found a business with more money in it than he had ever dreamed of making moreover he knew all the elements of that business had had experience in handling them tank building called for his trade that of the joiner iowa could wait 
by the summer of eighteen sixty he had his shop going at the mouth of cherry run near the well for which he had received his first order the shop running he built what was to be my mother's first home of her own the one for which with infinite confidence and infinite pain she had been waiting since her marriage four years and a half before it was in october of eighteen sixty that my father drove his little family over the allegheny foothills some forty miles there were two of us children now for in july of eighteen sixty my brother william walter tarbell named for his two grandfathers had been born close beside his shop father had built a shanty it had a living room with an alcove a family bedroom with trundle beds for us children and a kitchen a covered passage led into the shop which was soon to be the joy of my life for here were great piles of long odorous curly pine shavings into which to roll to take naps to trim my gown and in which to search day in and day out for the longest the curliest but these shavings and my delight in them were a later discovery my first reaction to my new surroundings was one of acute dislike it aroused me to a revolt which is the first thing i am sure i remember about my life the birth in me of conscious experience this revolt did not come from natural depravity on the contrary it was a natural and righteous protest against having the life and home i had known and which i loved taken away without explanation and a new scene a new set of rules which i did not like suddenly imposed my life in the log house had been full of joyous interests there were turkeys and ducks and chickens lambs and colts and calves kittens and puppies never could i be without playmates there were trees and woods and flowers in summer a great fireplace with popcorn and maple candy in winter and i an only grandchild the centre of it all but what had i come to as mother realized a place of perils a creek rushing wildly at the side of the house great oil pits sunken in the earth not far away a derrick inviting to adventurous climbing at the door no wonder that warnings and scoldings and occasional switchings dogged my steps moreover i was no longer the centre of the circle a baby filled her arms my arms a man still strange gave me orders and claimed her my mother it was not to be endured and so one november day just after my third birthday i announced i was going to leave going back to grandma very well my mother said i knew the way men went when they walked away from the shop and i followed it but not far across the valley in which we lived ran an embankment to my young eyes it was as high as a mountain and the nearer i came the higher it looked the higher and blacker and then suddenly as i came to its foot i realized that i had never been on the other side that i did not know the way to grandma's i knew i was beaten and sat down to think it over never in all these years since have i faced defeat known that i must retreat that i have not been again that little figure with the black mountain in front of it a little figure looking longingly at a shanty dim in the growing night but showing a light in the window finally i turned slowly back to the house and sat down on the steps it seemed a long time before the door opened and my mother in a surprised voice said why ida i thought you had gone to grandma's i don't know the way i said humbly very well come in and get your supper respect for my mother her wisdom in dealing with hard situations was born then i was not to be punished i was not to be laughed at i was to be accepted years later she told me of the unhappy hour she spent watching me go off so sturdily to come back so droopingly watching with tears running down her cheeks but determined i must learn my lesson it was a bit of wisdom she never ceased to practice my mother always let me carry out my revolts return when i would and no questions asked in the three years we spent in the shanty on the flats there was but one other episode that had for me the same self-revealing quality as this revolt it was my first attempt to test by experiment 
the brook which ran beside the house was rapid noisy in times of high water dangerous for children watching it fascinated i observed that some things floated on the surface others dropped to the bottom it set me to wondering what would happen to my little brother then in dresses if dropped in i had to find out there was a footbridge near the house and one day when i supposed i was unobserved i led him on to it and dropped him in his little skirt spread out and held him up fortunately at that moment his screams brought a nearby workman and he was rescued i suppose i was spanked of that i remember nothing only the peace of satisfied curiosity in the certainty that my brother belonged to the category of things which floated what i really remember of these early days concerns only my personal discoveries discoveries of the kind of person i was of the nature of things around me which stirred my curiosity whether a childish experience was deep enough to etch itself on my memory or i only know of it from hearing it told and retold i always decide by this test if i really remember it the happening is set in a scene a scene with a background exits entrances and properties i know i remember my revolt and defeat because i always see it as an act on a stage every detail every line clear of the pregnant bizarre and often tragic development going on about me i remember nothing yet the uncertainties and dangers of it were part of our daily fare whether there was oil in the ground in sufficient quantities to justify the prodigious effort being made to find it nobody could know if not the shop and shanty were a dead loss another long delay on the road to iowa all that winter of eighteen sixty and eighteen sixty one my father was asking himself that question but in eighteen sixty one it was answered when up and down oil creek a succession of flowing wells came in wells producing from three hundred to three thousand barrels a day fountain wells gushers spouters they called them from the great streams which rose straight into the air one to two hundred feet to fall in an oily green-black spray over the surrounding landscape deadly dangerous too as the oil region learned to its sorrow by a disaster almost at the doorsteps of our cherry run home it was the evening of april seventeenth eighteen sixty one the news of the fall of sumter had just reached the settlement remote as it was from rail and telegraph connections and all the men of the town had gathered after supper at one place or another to discuss the situation what did it mean what would the president do my father was sitting on a cracker barrel in the one general store as he and his friends talked a man ran in to tell the company that a fresh vein of oil had been struck in a well on the edge of the town its owner henry rouse had been drilling it deeper the oil was spouting over the derrick great news for the community still uncertain as to the extent of its field great news for my father it meant tanks everybody jumped to run to the well when the earth was rocked by a mighty explosion a careless light had ignited the gas which had spread from the flowing oil until it had enveloped everything in the vicinity before my father reached the place nineteen men among them his friend the well owner henry rouse had been burned to death how many had escaped and in what condition nobody knew late that night as my father and mother grieved they heard outside their door a stumbling something looking out they saw before them a terrible sight a man burned and swollen beyond recognition and yet alive alive enough to give his name one of their friends my mother took him in the alcove became a hospital for weeks she nursed him the task of the woman in a pioneer community a task which she accepted as her part thanks to her care the man lived the relics of that tragedy were long about our household comforts and bed quilts she had pieced and quilted for iowa stained with linseed oil but too precious to be thrown away but all this is as something read in a book 
something which has become more poignant as the years have gone by and i am able to feel what those long weeks of care over that broken man meant to my mother the business prospered the shop grew little do i remember of all this or the increased comforts of life or moving into the new house on the hillside above the town by this time known as rouseville but the change in the outlook on the world about me i do remember we had lived on the edge of an active oil farm and oil town no industry of man in its early days has ever been more destructive of beauty order decency than the production of petroleum all about us rose derricks squatted engine houses and tanks the earth about them was streaked and damp with the dumpings of the pumps which brought up regularly the sand and clay and rock through which the drill had made its way if oil was found if the well flowed every tree every shrub every bit of grass in the vicinity was coated with black grease and left to die tar and oil stained everything if the well was dry a rickety derrick piles of debris oily holes were left for nobody ever cleaned up in those days but we left the centre of this disorder went to the hillside looked down on it and as for me i no longer saw it for opposite us was a hillside so steep it had never been drilled it was clothed with the always changing beauty of trees and shrubs the white shade flowers and the red maples the long garlands of laurel and azalea in the spring the green of every shade through the summer the crimson and gold russets and tans of the fall the frost and snow-draped trees of the winter i did not see the derricks for the trees the hillside above our house and the paths which led around it became a playground in which i reveled i was not the only one to forget the ugliness of the valley and remember through life the beauty of those hillsides years later i was to know fairly well one of the great figures in the development of oil henry h rogers then the active head of the standard oil company we discovered in talking over the early days of the industry that at the very moment i was beginning to run the hills above rouseville he was running a small refinery on the creek and living on a hillside just below ours separated only by a narrow ravine along each side of which ran a path up that path mr rogers told me i used to carry our washing every monday morning go for it every saturday night probably i've seen you hunting flowers on your side of the ravine how beautiful it was i was never happier that reminiscence of henry h rogers is only one of several reasons i have for heartily liking as fine a pirate as ever flew his flag in wall street soon after we went to the home on the hill the oil country at that moment suffering a depression was stirred by the news that a great well had been struck ten miles from rouseville at pithole an isolated territory to which the veterans in the business had never given a thought the news caused a wild scramble a motley procession of men with and without money with and without decency seeking leases jobs opportunity for adventure excitement and swindling travelled on foot or horseback up the valley of cherry run in full view from our house father was one of the first to take advantage of the pithole discovery putting up his tank shops there and doing a smashing business during the short life of the field its bottom fell out in eighteen sixty nine he rode back and forth from his shop on a little saddle horse flora beautiful creature usually with considerable sums of money in his pocket the country was full of ruffians and stories of robbery were common when he was very late in returning mother would walk the floor wringing her hands i could never go to bed those nights until he had returned not because i felt her anxiety but because of the excitement and mystery of it i carried a dramatic picture of him in mind a kind of paul revere dashing along the lonely road the rain on flora's neck his pistol in hand but he always came home always brought the money he had collected which he must keep in the tiny iron safe in his office annexed to the house until he could carry it to oil city where he banked 
my life became rapidly more conscious now that i had left the flats behind experience deeper here was my first realization of tragedy it was at the spring of eighteen sixty five father was coming up the hill mother and i were watching for him usually he walked with a brisk step head up but now his step was slow his head dropped mother ran to meet him crying frank frank what is it i did not hear the answer but i shall always see my mother turning at his words burying her face in her apron running into her room sobbing as if her heart would break and then the house was shut up and crape was put on all the doors and i was told that lincoln was dead from that time the name spelt tragedy and mystery why all this sorrow over a man we had never seen who did not belong to our world my world was there something beyond the circle of hills within which i lived that concerned me why and in what way did this mysterious outside concern me i was soon to learn that tragedy did not always come from a mysterious beyond what a chain of catastrophes it took to teach the men and women who were developing the new industry the constant risk they ran in handling either crude or refined oil they came to our very door when a neighboring woman hurrying to build a fire in her cook stove poured oil on the wood before she had made sure there were no live coals in the firebox an awful explosion occurred and she and two women who ran to her assistance were burned to a crisp i heard horrified whisperings about me the refusal to tell me what had happened aroused a terrible curiosity i gathered that the bodies were laid out in a house not far away and when nobody was looking stole in to look at them broken sleep for me for nights the mystery of death finally came into our household there had been a fourth child born in the house on the hill little frankie we always called him blue-eyed like my father the sunniest of us all for weeks one season he lay in the parlor fighting for life scarlet fever a disease more dreaded by mothers in those days than even smallpox daily i stood helpless agonized outside the door behind which little frankie lay screaming and fighting the doctor i remember even today how long the white marks lasted on the knuckles of my hands after the agony behind the closed door had died down and my clenched fists relaxed little frankie died became a pathetic and beloved tradition in the household my little sister who had made a terrible and successful fight against the disease told me how she could not understand why father and mother cried when they talked of frankie if they want to see him she thought why do they not put up a ladder from the top of the hill up to the sky into heaven and climb up if frankie is there god would let them see him i have said that my first recollection of lincoln was the impression made by the tragedy of his death that this was so was not for the lack of material on him in our household my father was an ardent republican back in fifty six he had written from his river trip hurrah for fremont and dayton as soon as he had more money than the actual needs of the family required he subscribed to harper's weekly harper's monthly the new york tribune began to buy books of all of these i remember only the weekly and monthly my brother and i used to lie by the hour flat on our stomachs heels in the air turning over the exciting pages of the war numbers but none of it went behind my eyes none concerned me only now when i go back to the files of those old papers there is a whispering of something once familiar of the monthly i have more distinct recollections it was in these that i first began to read freely many a private picnic did i have with the monthly under the thorn bushes on the hillside above oil creek a lunch basket at my side there are still in the family storeroom copies of harper's monthly stained with lemon pie dropped when i was too deep into a story to be careful here i read my first dickens my first thackeray my first marion evans as george eliot then signed herself my first wilkie collins came to me in the weekly great literature 
all pirated, I was to learn much later. My friend Viola Roseborough tells me that at this time she was reading Harper's pirated paper-bound copies of Dickens. It was much later that they came my way. However, all the reading I was doing was not so respectable. On the sly, I was devouring a sheet forbidden to the household, the police gazette, the property of the men around the house, for we had men around the house, men of various degrees of acceptability to my mother, but all necessary to my father's enterprises. The business had grown. It meant a clerk, bosses, workmen. In a pioneer community like ours, it was hard to find comfortable living quarters for single men. My father and mother, both brought up on farms, accepted as a matter of course the housing and feeding of hired men so it was in line with their experience, as well as with the necessities of the case, that our household was arranged to take care of a certain number of men connected with my father's business. For sleeping quarters, a bunkhouse was built on the hillside. Mornings and evenings they sat at the family table. This accepting men of whose manners and ways she often heartily disapproved was distasteful to my mother, but she had not been a schoolteacher for nothing and she applied her notions of discipline. She would not have swearing, drinking, rough manners, and certainly she would not have had the police gazette in the house. But the men had it, and now and then, when my brother and I played about the bunkhouse, it was easy for me to pick up a copy and slip it away where my dearest girlfriend and I looked unashamed and entirely unknowing on its rough and brutal pictures. If they were obscene, we certainly never knew it. There was a wanton gaiety about the women, a violent rakishness about the men. Wicked, we supposed, but not the less interesting for that. One reason the Police Gazette fascinated me was that it pictured a kind of life I knew to be flourishing in a neighboring settlement, a settlement where my father had shops run by a boss who, as well as his sister, was a family friend, and where I was often allowed to visit. This settlement, Petroleum Center, had by something like general consent become Oil Creek's sink of iniquity. The discovery of oil, the growing certainty that it was the beginning of a new industry, that money was flowing into the oil region quickly, brought an invading host of men and women seeking fortunes. It was a new and rich field for tricksters, swindlers, exploiters of vice in every known form. They were soon setting up shops in every settlement, and to the credit of the manhood of the oil region, usually being driven out by self-directed vigilantes. At Rouseville, a joy boat, which made its way up the creek that first winter and tied up near my father's shop, was cut loose in the middle of the night after its arrival. Its visitors found themselves floating down the Allegheny River the next morning and obliged to walk back. From that time, open vice shunned the town. But when wealth poured out of the ground at Petroleum Center, there was too great excitement to think of order, decency. Before it was realized, the town was alive with every known form of wantonness and wickedness. By the time I was allowed to visit our friends there, I saw from the corner of my eye, as I walked sedately the length of the street, saloons, dance halls, brothels, and I noted many curious things. The house where I visited stood on a slope overlooking one of the most notorious dance halls of the oil region, Gus Riles. Often I left my bed at night and watched that long low building from which rose loud laughter, ribald songs, shouts, curses. Later, horror was added to Gus Riles' fascination, for here a Rouseville boy was shot one night. If Petroleum Center was giving me an opportunity to feed my curiosity about things in the world of which I was not supposed to know, it happened also to be the indirect means of awaking my interest in the stars, one of the most beautiful interests of my youth. My father had seen the early passing of the wooden oil tank, the coming of the iron tank, and had used his capital to become an oil producer. One of his first investments had been an oil farm on the hills above the wicked town which so excited my curiosity. His partner in this venture, M. E. Hess, lived on this farm with his family. 
in that family was a daughter about my age and bearing my name ida we became friends and visited back and forth as chance offered my chance came often when Mr. Hess, riding with a companion over the hills to Rouseville to consult with father, dropped his companion and took me back with him, usually at night. A fine pair of saddle horses he had, high fly and shoe fly. My first experience in horseback riding was following him on shoe fly over the hills after dark. Mr. Hess was an altogether unusual man, educated, with a vein of poetry in him. As we rode, he would stop every now and then to name the stars, trace the constellations, repeat the legends. My first consciousness of space, its beauty, its something more than beauty, came then. Not a bad counterbalance for what I was gathering in the town below the farm on the hill, and seeing reproduced in the police gazette, which so perfectly pictured its activities. But there were other correcting forces at work on me. The men who form the vigilante committee to make Rouseville difficult for commercialized vice, my father one of them, set themselves early to establishing civilizing agencies. First, a church. It was decided by the men and women who were to build and support this church that it should be of the denomination of which there were the largest number in the community. The Methodists had the numbers, and so my father and mother, who were Presbyterians, became, and remained, Methodists. Their support was active. We did not merely go to church. We stayed to class meeting. We went to Sunday school, where both father and mother had classes. We went to Wednesday night, or was it Thursday night, prayer meeting. And when there was a revival, we went every night. In my tenth or eleventh year, I went forward, not from a sense of guilt, but because everybody else was doing it. My sense of sin came after it was all over, and I was tucked away in bed at night. I had been keenly conscious, as I knelt at the mourner's bench, that the long crimson ribbons which hung from my hat must look beautiful on my cream-colored coat. The realization of that hypocrisy cut me to the heart. I knew myself a sinner then, and the relief I sought in prayer was genuine. I never confessed. It wasn't the kind of sin other converts talked about. But it aroused self-observation. I learned that often when I was saying the polite or proper thing, I was thinking quite differently. For a long time it made me secretly unhappy thinking that in me alone ran an underground river of thought. Later I began to suspect that other people were like this, that always there flowed a stream of unspoken thought under the spoken thought. It made me wary of strangers. A side of my life which moves me deeply now, as I think back, was the continuous effort of my father and mother to give me what were called advantages, to use their increasing income to awaken and develop in me a taste for things which they had always been denied. They wanted music in the household, and our grandest possession became a splendid Bradbury Square piano, a really noble instrument with one of the finest, mellowest tones that I have ever heard in a piano. A music teacher turned up in the community, and I was at once set at five-finger exercises, and I was kept at them, and all that follows them, for many years. But I found no joy in what I was doing. It is possible that with different teachers from those available, there might have been a spring touched. For untrained as I am, I am not without a certain appreciation of music. I mastered the mechanics of piano playing well enough, however, to become later one of the regular performers in the high school in the town to which we were to move, Titusville, Pennsylvania. I remembered nothing of this until two of my old friends in Titusville, school chums, told me that I was one of the three or four who played the piano for the morning exercises, that I sometimes played my show pieces and that on one occasion I was an actor in a scene which they recalled with glee. They told me I was playing a duet with a classmate. We either lost our place or did not agree as to time, stopped entirely, argued the matter out, began over, and this time went through without dissension. But I have only this second-hand memory of my contribution to the musical life of the Titusville High School. 
i remember the efforts of my father and mother to show me something of the outside world much more clearly than i do those to awaken my interest in books and music there were little trips once as far as cleveland the whole family the marvel of the best hotel of new hats and coats and armfuls of toys there were summers at the farm only thirty miles away best remembered and most enjoyed were the all-day excursion picnics no one can understand the social life of a great body of the american people in the latter part of the nineteenth century without understanding the hold the picnic had on them the tarbell household took the picnic so seriously that it had a special equipment of stout market baskets tin cups and plates steel knives and forks tin spoons worn napkins the paper ones were then unheard of the menus were as fixed as that for a thanksgiving dinner veal loaf cold tongue hard-boiled eggs to a piece buttered rusks spiced peaches jelly cucumber pickles chow chow cookies doughnuts we called them fried cakes and a special family cake and you ate until you were full our grandest picnic excursions in those days were to chautauqua lake a charming sheet of water only some fifty miles from home near the head of the lake lay an old chautauqua county town mayville at its foot jamestown where my father for several years had been a student in the academy and from which in vacations he had gone on his annual trips down the ohio loaded with big baskets of lunch we took an early train to mayville changed there to a little white steamer zigzagged the length of the lake twenty or so miles stopping at point after point we ate our lunch en route and at jamestown went uptown to drink a bottle of pop and then came the slow return home where we arrived after dark exhausted by pleasure three or four miles from mayville on the west side of the lake jutted a wooded promontory fair point the site in those days of a methodist camp meeting and here we sometimes stopped for the day we never liked it so well as going to jamestown neither did father end of chapter one Chapter Two of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleeper Fox recording is in the public domain. I decide to be a biologist. Five years went by in the house on the hill, and then, in 1870, when I was thirteen, I found myself in Titusville, Pennsylvania, in a new house my father had built. How characteristic of the instability of the oil towns of that day, as well as of the frugality of my father, was this house from the beginning of the pit-hole excitement he had as i have said made money more than he ever could have dreamed i fancy and then about eighteen sixty nine practically without warning the bottom fell out as the vernacular of the region put it the end shut up my father's shops there but it also gave us the makings of a home in that rapid development only four years long a town of some twenty thousand had grown up with several big hotels among them one called the bonta house it had features which delighted my father long french windows really fine iron brackets supporting its verandas handsome woodwork the bonta house was said to have cost sixty thousand dollars but its owners were glad to take the six hundred dollars father offered when the town blew up he paid the money tore down the building loaded its iron brackets and fine doors and windows mouldings and all and i suppose much of its timber on to wagons and carted it ten miles away to titusville where out of it he built the house which was our home for many years titusville was not like rouseville which had suddenly sprung from the mud as uncertain as a mushroom of the future it had been a substantial settlement twenty years before oil was found there small but sturdy with a few families who had made money chiefly in lumber owning good homes carefully guarding the order and decency of the place the discovery of oil overran the settlement with hundreds of fortune-seekers 
they came from far and near on foot horseback wagon the nearest railroad connection was sixteen miles away and the roads and fields leading in were soon cut beyond recognition by the heavy hauling its streets at times impassable with mud the new industry demanded machinery tools lumber and the bigger it grew the greater the demand titusville the birthplace of all this activity as well as the gateway down the creek must furnish food and shelter for caravans of strangers shops for their trades offices for speculators and brokers dealers in oil lands and leases for oil producers surveyors and draughtsmen all the factors of the big business organization necessary to develop the industry in eighteen sixty two the overflow was doubled by the arrival of a railroad with a connection sixteen miles away with the east and west the disbanding of the army in june of eighteen sixty five brought a new rush men still in uniform their rifles and knapsacks on their backs most of this fresh inflow was bound to the scene of the latest excitement pithole stampeded though she was titusville refused to give up her idea of what a town should be she kept a kind of order waged a steady fight on pickpockets drunkards wantons and in this she was backed by the growing number of men and women who having found their chance for fortune in oil wanted a town fit for their families after churches the schools were receiving the most attention it was the titusville schools which had determined my father and mother to make the town their permanent home but school did not play a serious part in my scheme of things at the start i went because i was sent and had no interest in what went on i was thirteen but i had never been in a crowded room before in a small private school the teacher had been my friend here i was not conscious my teacher recognized my existence i soon became a truant but the competent ruler of that schoolroom knew more than i realized she was able to spot a truant and one day when i turned up after an unexplainable absence she suddenly turned on me and read me a scathing lecture i cannot remember that i was ashamed or humiliated only amazed but something in me asserted itself i suppose that here a decent respect for the opinions of mankind was born at least i became on the instant a model pupil a few months later i passed into high school and when at the end of the year the grades were averaged at a ceremony where everybody was present i stood at the head of the honor roll nobody could have been more surprised i had not been working for the honor roll i had simply been doing what they expected me to do as i understood it and here i was at the top i remember i felt very serious about it having made the top once i knew what would be expected of me i couldn't let my father and mother or my teachers down so i continued to learn my lessons it was a good deal like being good at a game i liked to work out the mathematics and translations good puzzles but that they had any relation to my life i was unconscious and then suddenly among these puzzles i was set to solve i found in certain textbooks the sesame which was to free my curiosity stir desires to know set me working on my own to find out more than these books had to offer the texts which did all this for me were a series i suspect a modern teacher might laugh at steele's fourteen weeks in zoology geology botany natural philosophy chemistry here i was suddenly on a ground which meant something to me from childhood plants insects stones were what i saw when i went abroad what i brought home to press to put into bottles to litter up the house the hills about rouseville were rich in treasures for such a collector but nobody had ever taught me more than their common names i had never realized that they were subjects for study like latin and geometry and rhetoric and other such unmeaning tasks they were too fascinating but here my pleasure became my duty school suddenly became exciting now i could justify my tramps before breakfast on the hills 
justify my collections, and soon I knew what I was to be, a scientist. Life was beginning to be very good, for what I liked best to do had a reason. No doubt this uplift was helped by the general cheerfulness of the family under our new conditions of life. Things were going well in father's business. There was an ease such as we had never known, luxuries we had never heard of. Our first Christmas in the new home was celebrated lavishly. Far away was that first Christmas in the shanty on the flats, when there was nothing but nuts and candy, and my mother and father promising, Just wait, just wait, the day will come. The day had come. A gorgeous Christmas tree, a velvet cloak, and a fur coat for my mother. I haven't the least idea what there was for the rest of us, but those coats were an epoch in my life, my first notion of elegance. This family blossoming was characteristic of the town. Titusville was gay, confident of its future. It was spending money on schools and churches, was building an opera house where Janoshik was soon to play, Christine Nilsson to sing. More and more fine homes were going up. Its main street had been graded and worked until fine afternoons, winter and summer, it was cleared by four o'clock for the trotting of the fast horses the rich were importing. When New Year's Day came, every woman received wine, cakes, salads, cold meats on the table. Every man went calling. That is, Titusville was taking on metropolitan airs, led by a few citizens who knew New York and its ways even spoke familiarly of jay gould and jim fisk both of whom naturally enough had their eye on us did not the eerie road from which they at the moment were filling their pockets regard oil as one of its most profitable freights we were grain for their mill there was reason for confidence in the dozen years since the first well was drilled the oil creek valley had yielded nearly thirty-three million barrels of crude oil producing transporting refining marketing exporting and by-products had been developed into an organized industry which was now believed to have a splendid future then suddenly this gay prosperous town received a blow between the eyes self-dependent in all but transportation and locally in that through the pipelines it was rapidly laying to shipping points it was dependent on the railroads for the carrying of its crude oil to outside refining points and for a shipping of both crude and refined to the seaboard a rich and steady traffic for which the oil region felt the railroads ought to be grateful but it was the railroads that struck the blow a few refiners outside the region cleveland pittsburgh philadelphia concocted a marvelous scheme which they had the persuasive power to put over with the railroads a big scheme by which those in the ring would be able to ship crude and refined oil more cheaply than anybody outside and then marvelous invention they would receive in addition to their advantage a drawback on every barrel of oil shipped by anyone not in the group those in the south improvement company as the masterpiece was called, were to be rewarded for shipping, and those not in, to be doubly penalized. Of course, it was a secret scheme. The oil region did not learn of it until it had actually been put into operation in Cleveland, Ohio, and leaked out. What did it mean to the oil region? It meant that the man who produced the oil and all outside refiners were entirely at the mercy of this group who, if they would, could make the price of crude oil as well as refined. But it was a plan which could not survive daylight. As soon as the oil region learned of it, a wonderful row followed. There were nightly anti-monopoly meetings, violent speeches, processions. Trains of oil cars loaded for members of the offending corporation were raided. The oil run on the ground. Their buyers turned out of the oil exchanges appeals were made to the state legislature to congress for an interstate commerce bill producers and refiners uniting for protection 
i remember a night when my father came home with a grim look on his face and told how he with scores of other producers had signed a pledge not to sell to the cleveland ogre that alone had profited from the scheme a new name that of the standard oil company replacing the name south improvement company in popular contempt there were long days of excitement father coming home at night silent and stern a sternness even unchanged by his after-dinner cigar which had come to stand in my mind as a sign of his relaxation after a hard day he no longer told of the funny things he had seen and heard during the day he no longer played his jew's harp nor sang to my little sister on the arm of his chair the verses we had all been brought up on augusta maine on the kennebec river conquered new hampshire on the merrimac etc the commotion spread the leaders of the new york petroleum association left out of the original conspiracy and in a number of cases as was soon to be shown outraged chiefly for that reason sent a committee to the oil region to see what was doing the committee was joyfully welcomed partly because its chairman was well known to them all it was my rouseville neighbor henry h rogers mr rogers had left the creek in eighteen sixty seven and become a partner in the pratt firm of refiners and exporters of brooklyn new york he and his associates saw as clearly as his old friends in the oil region that let the south improvement company succeed in its plans for a monopoly everybody not in the ring would be forced to go out of business the new york men seem to have been convinced that the plans for saving themselves which the organized producers and refiners were laying stood a good chance of success for back in new york mr rogers gave a long interview to the herald he did not mince words cleveland and pittsburgh were straining every nerve to create a monopoly they would succeed if their control of the railroads continued he and his fellows felt as the men in the oil region did that the breaking up of the south improvement company was a necessity for self-existence they were as bold in action as in words for when a little later the president of the standard oil company of cleveland john d rockefeller to date the only beneficiary of the south improvement company sought an interview in new york with mr rogers and his committee he was treated cavalierly and according to the newspapers retreated after a brief reception looking badly crestfallen thus was the henry h rogers of eighteen seventy two out of the long struggle begun as a scrimmage came finally a well-developed cooperative movement guaranteeing fair play all around it was signed by the standard oil company's representative and all the oil-carrying railroads the railroads indeed were the first to succumb knowing as they did that what they were doing was contrary to the common law of the land and being thundered at as they were by the press and politicians of all the country i told willie not to go into that scheme said old commodore vanderbilt and jay gould whined i didn't sign until everybody else had out of the alarm and bitterness and confusion i gathered from my father's talk a conviction to which i still hold that what had been undertaken was wrong my father told me it was as if somebody had tried to crowd me off the road now i knew very well that on this road where our little white horse trotted up and down we had our side there were rules you couldn't use the road unless you obeyed those rules it was not only bad manners but dangerous to attempt to disobey them the railroads so said my father ran through the valley by the consent of the people they had given them a right of way the road on which i trotted was a right of way one man had the same right as another but the railroads had given to one something they would not give to another it was wrong i sometimes hear learned people arguing that in the days of this historic quarrel everybody took rebates it was the accepted way if they had lived in the oil region through those days in eighteen seventy two they would have realized that far from being accepted it was fought tooth and nail everybody did not do it in the nature of the offense everybody could not do it 
the strong wrested from the railroads the privilege of preying upon the weak and the railroads never dared give the privilege save under promise of secrecy in walking through the world there is a choice for a man to make he can choose the fair and open path the path which sound ethics sound democracy and the common law prescribe or choose the secret way by which he can get the better of his fellow man it was that choice made by powerful men that suddenly confronted the oil region the sly secret greedy way won in the end and bitterness and unhappiness and incalculable ethical deterioration for the country at large came out of that struggle and others like it which were going on all over the country an old struggle with old defeats but never without men willing to make stiff fights for their rights even if it cost them all they ever hoped to possess at all events uncomprehending as i was in that fine fight there was born in me a hatred of privilege privilege of any sort it was all pretty hazy to be sure but still it was well at fifteen to have one definite plank based on things seen and heard ready for a future platform of social and economic justice if i should ever awake to my need of one at the moment however my reflection did not carry me beyond the wrongness of the privilege which had so upset our world contradicting as it did the principle of consideration for others which had always been basic in our family and religious teaching i could not think further in this direction for now my whole mind was absorbed by the overwhelming discovery that the world was not made in six days of twenty-four hours each my interest in science which meant for me simply larger familiarity with plants and animals and rocks had set me looking over my father's books among them i found hugh miller's testimony of the rocks and sat down to read it gradually i grasped with a combination of horror and amazement that instead of a creation the earth was a growth that the creative days i had so clearly visualized were periods eons long not to be visualized it was all too clear to deny backed as it was by a wealth of geological facts if this were true why did the bible describe so particularly the work of each day describe it and declare and the evening and the morning were the first day etc and end and he rested on the seventh day hugh miller labored to prove that there was no necessary contradiction between genesis and geology but i was too startled to accept what he said a bible that needed reconciling that did not mean what it said was not the rock i had supposed my feet were on that words could have other meaning than that i had always given them i had not yet grasped i was soon to find that the biblical day was disturbing a great part of the christian world was a chief point of controversy in the church i had hardly made my discovery when genesis and geology appeared in the pulpit of the methodist church of titusville pennsylvania filling this pulpit at that time was a remarkable and brilliant man amos norton craft dr craft was an indefatigable student it was told of him to the wonder of the church that he laid aside yearly two hundred dollars of his meagre salary to buy books like all the ministers of those days he was obliged to face the challenges of science many of his fellows most of them so far as my knowledge went took refuge in heated declarations that the conclusions that science was making were profane godless an affront to divinity not so dr craft he accepted them strove to fit them into the christian system he startled his congregation and interested the town profoundly by announcing an evening course of lectures on the reconciliation of genesis and geology the first of the series dealt with the universe i had never known there was one the stars yes i could name planets and constellations and liked nothing better than to lie on my back and watch them but a universe with figures of its size was staggering 
i went away from those sunday night lectures fascinated horror-stricken confused a most miserable child for not only was my idea of the world shattered not only was i left dizzily gyrating in a space to which there was no end but the whole christian system i had been taught was falling into a general ruin i began to feel that i ought to leave the church i did not believe what i was supposed to believe i did not have the consolation of pride in emancipation which i find youth frequently has when it finds itself obliged to desert the views it has been taught indeed i doubted greatly whether it was an emancipation what troubled me most was that if i gave up the church i had nothing to put in place of something it had given me which seemed to me of supreme importance summed up that something was in the commandment do as you would be done by certainly nothing which hugh miller or herbert spencer whom i began to read in eighteen seventy two in the popular science monthly helped me here they gave me nothing to take the place of what had always been the unwritten law of the tarbell household based as i knew upon the teachings of the bible the gist of the bible as it had come to me was what i later came to call the brotherhood of man practically it was that we should do nothing say nothing that injured another that was a catastrophe and when it happened in our household an inarticulate household on the whole the one extraordinarily conscious of the minds and hearts of one another when it happened the whole household was shadowed for hours and it was not until by sensitive unspoken efforts the injured one had been consoled that we went on about our usual ways this was something too precious to give up and something for which i did not find a substitute in the scientific thinking and arguing in which i was floundering the scientists offered me nothing to guide me in human relations and they did not satisfy a craving from which i could not escape that was the need of direction the need of that which i called god and which i still call god perhaps i was a calculating person a cautious one at all events i made up my mind to wait and find out something which better took the place of those things which i so valued it cost me curious little compromises compromises that i had to argue myself into the chief came in repeating the creed i could repeat conceived of the holy ghost born of the virgin mary because for many years i did not know what that meant it was the resurrection that disturbed me i could not accept it nor could i accept the promise of personal immortality that had become a grave doubt with me when i first grew dizzy with the consciousness of the vastness of the universe why should i expect to exist forever as a conscious mind in that vast emptiness what would become of me i did not want to think about it and i came then to a conviction that has never left me that as far as i am concerned immortality is not my business that there is too much for me to attend to in this mortal life without over-speculation on the immortal that it is not necessary to my peace of mind or to my effort to be a decent and useful person to have a definite assurance about the affairs of the next world i say this with humility for i believe that some such assurance is necessary to the peace and usefulness of many persons and i am the last to scoff at the revelations they claim and yet it was hard to give up heaven among the books on our shelves many of them orthodox religious books was one that had a frontispiece which i had accepted as a definite picture of the heaven to which i was to go jehovah sat on a throne cherubim and seraphim around him rank upon rank of angels filling the great amphitheatre below i always wondered where my place would be and whether there would be any chance to work up in heaven as there seemed to be on earth to become a cherub but giving up this heaven was by no means the greatest tragedy in my discovery that the world was not made in six days of twenty-four hours each the real tragedy was the birth in me of doubt and uncertainty nothing was ever again to be final always i was to ask myself when confronted with a problem a system 
a scheme, a code, a leader, how can I accept without knowing more? The quest of the truth had been born in me, the most tragic and incomplete, as well as the most essential, of man's quests. It was while groping my way, frightened like a lost child, I found a word to hold to. Evolution. Things grew. What did they grow from? They all started somewhere. I was soon applying the idea. Nothing seemed to matter now except to find the starting point of things, and, having that, see why and how they grew into something else. How were you to go to work to find the start of life? With a microscope. And I soon was in the heat of my first intellectual passion, my first and greatest, that for the microscope. With a microscope, I could perhaps get an answer to my mystification about the beginning of life, where it started, and then I believed I should find God again. I was a practical person, apparently, for I at once began to save my money, and soon had enough to put into a small instrument. The house in Titusville, like many of its period, had a tower room, a steep staircase running up to it. This room was surrounded on three sides with big double windows. I begged to have it for my own. Here I was allowed to set up shop. Here I had my desk, my papers, and my microscope. Here I was alone with my problems. That little microscope had a good deal to do with my determination to go to college. If I was to become a microscopist, I had already adopted that word, I must study, get an education. This determination of mine to get an education, go to college, was chiefly due, no doubt, to the active crusade going on in those days for what we called woman's rights. Ours was a yeasty time, the ferment reaching into every relation of life, attacking and remodeling every tradition, every philosophy. As my father was hard hit by the attack on his conception of individualism in a democracy, freedom with strictest consideration for the rights and needs of others. As I was struggling, with all the handicaps of my ignorance, with the nature of life, a search for God, so my mother was facing, a little reluctantly, a readjustment of her status in the home and in society. She had grown up with the woman's rights movement. Had she never married, I feel sure she would have sought to vindicate her sex by seeking a higher education possibly a profession. The fight would have delighted her. If she had gone to Iowa, she surely would have soon joined the agitation led there in the late fifties by Amelia Bloomer, the inventor of the practical and ugly costume which still carries her name, the real founder of dress reform. We owe it to Amelia Bloomer that we can, without public ridicule, wear short skirts and stout boots, be as sensible as our feminine natures permit which is not saying much for us when it comes to fashions. But my mother found herself a pioneer in the oil region, confronted by the sternest of problems which were to be settled only by immediate individual effort and goodwill. The move to Titusville, however, soon put my mother in touch with the crusade for equal political rights, which was taking the place of the earlier movement for women's rights. The Civil War had slowed up that agitation, Indeed, many of its best talking points had been conceded and were slowly going into practice. Most of the militants had thrown themselves into war work, and, after the war, into the campaign for Negro suffrage. But the passing of the Fourteenth Amendment in 1868, for the first time introducing the word male into the Constitution, aroused a sense of outrage, not only in the advocates of equal rights, but in many women who had not approved of previous agitations. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the greatest of the early leaders, failing to keep the humiliating distinction out of the amendment, began a tremendous national crusade for woman suffrage. They marshaled a group of splendid women and undertook an intensive campaign meant to reach every woman in the country. It reached us in Titusville, even reached our home where my father and mother, always hospitable to crusaders, opened their doors to them. 
i remember best mary livermore and francis willard not that either touched me saw me of this neglect i was acutely conscious i noted too that the men we entertained did notice me talked to me as a person not merely as a possible member of a society they were promoting there was neil dow father by this time was a prohibitionist who let me show him our dante with gustave dore's pictures men were nicer than women to me i mentally noted as the struggle for equal rights grew in heat i became aware that it was far from a united struggle that as a matter of fact leaders and followers were spending almost as much time disapproving of one another's methods as fighting for their cause the friction came largely from the propensity of mrs stanton and miss anthony to form alliances shocking to many of their oldest and wisest friends before the war they had rather recklessly from a political point of view supported easier divorce as one of their friends wrote them they had in so doing broken the heart of the portly evening post and nearly driven the tribune to the grave time had not cooled their ardor for strange bedfellows they had made an alliance now of which i heard no little talk by my mother and her friends it was with the two most notorious women in the eye of the public at the moment hussies conservative circles in titusville pennsylvania called them victoria woodhull and tennessee claflin it was not difficult for even a girl of fifteen to pick up some idea of what these women were so well did they advertise themselves and so delightedly did the press back them up in their doings beginning their careers as clairvoyants they had developed professionally their undoubted powers until they were in the sixties the two best-known and best-paid trance physicians of their day victoria claimed to have raised a child from the dead and tennessee the harder worker of the two made enough money to keep thirty-five relations in comfort if i am a humbug sometimes look at the deadbeats i have to support was her answer to those who accused her of abusing her talents both women frankly advocated free love and so it was believed quite as frankly practiced it with this equipment they entered wall street in the eighteen sixties as consultants the lady brokers they were called they quickly built up a profitable business old commodore vanderbilt was so tickled by their combination of beauty and effrontery talents and ambitions that he is said to have proposed marriage to victoria he was more valuable as a friend she kept his picture on the wall of the salon where she received her clients and under it the framed motto simply to thy cross i cling in eighteen seventy victoria woodhull announced herself as a candidate for president in eighteen seventy two so successful was she in attracting and holding big audiences and so brilliantly did she present the arguments for equal rights that mrs stanton and miss anthony threw scruples to the wind and took her into their camp from which promptly there was a considerable exodus of scandalized ladies not only did victoria win the countenance of these two great leaders but she involved them in the beecher tilton scandal which for months she worked steadily to force before the public the reverberations of the conflict inside the suffrage party together with what i picked up about the beecher trial i read the testimony word by word in our newspapers did not increase my regard for my sex they did not seem to substantiate what i heard about the subjection of women nor did what i observed nearer home convince me subjection seemed to me fairly divided that is all i saw there were henpecked men as well as downtrodden women the chief unfairness which i recognized was in the handling of household expenses women who must do the spending were obliged to ask for money or depend on charging my mother had not been trained to live on as generous a scale as was now possible but my father never said we have so much and no more to spend they worked often at cross purposes so i gathered as i listened to intimate talks between women listened to suffrage speakers read the literature so did many american husbands and wives 
i felt no restraint myself for i always had at least a little money and i too could charge this foolish practice led me into funny expenditures i had no sense of the appropriate in clothes often i had an ardent desire for something fitted only for grown-ups and i always had a keen ambition to fit myself out for occasions sometime in the early seventies clara louise kellogg came to town my father and mother were in the west but they had arranged that i was to hear her it seemed as if some kind of regalia was necessary so i charged a wide pink sash and a pair of yellow kid gloves out of the agitation for rights as it came to me two rights that were worth going after quite definitely segregated themselves the right to an education and the right to earn my living education and economic independence the older i grew the more determined i became to be independent i saw only one way teach but if i was to teach i must fit myself go to college my father and mother agreed i had a clear notion of what i wanted to teach natural science particularly the microscope for i was to be a biologist i made my choice cornell first opened to women in eighteen seventy two but at the moment when the steps to enter Cornell were to be taken, there appeared in the household, as an over-Sunday guest, the president of a small college in our neighborhood, only thirty miles away, Allegheny. Among the patrons of that college was the Methodist organization known as the Erie Conference, to which the Titusville Church belonged. I had heard of it annually, when a representative appeared in our pulpit, told its story, and asked for support. The president, Dr. Lucius Bugby, was a delightful and entertaining guest, and, learning that I was headed Cornellward, adroitly painted the advantages of Allegheny. It was near home. It was a ward of our church. It had responded to the cry of women for educational opportunity, and had opened its doors before the institution I had chosen was not here an opportunity for a serious young woman interested in the advancement of her sex had i not a responsibility in the matter if the few colleges that had opened their doors were to keep them open if others were to imitate their example two things were essential women must prove they wanted a college education by supporting those in their vicinity and they must prove by their scholarship what many doubted that they had minds as capable of development as young men allegheny had not a large territory to draw from i must be a pioneer as a matter of fact the only responsibility i had felt and assumed in going to college was entirely selfish and personal but the sense of responsibility was not lacking or dormant in me it was one of the few things i had found out about myself in the shanty on the flats when i was six years old and there was a new baby in the family the woman looking after my mother had said now you are old enough to make a cup of tea and take it to her i think in all my life since nothing has seemed more important more wonderful to me than being called upon by an elder to do something for mother to be responsible for it i can feel that cup in my hand as i cautiously took it to the bed and can see my mother's touching smile as she thanked me perhaps there came to her a realization that this rebelling experimenting child might one day become a partner in the struggle for life so serious for her at the moment always to be more or less serious but to return to dr bugby and his argument before he left the house i had agreed to enter allegheny in the fall of eighteen seventy six and that i did what did i take with me well i took from what my earliest years i had been told was necessary to everyone a purpose always spelled with a capital i had an outline of the route which would lead to its realization making outlines of what was in my mind was the one and only fruit that i had gathered so far from long terms of struggle over grammar rhetoric composition outlines which held together i had discovered cleared my mind gave it something to follow i outlined all my plans as i had diagrammed sentences 
it was not a poor beginning for one who eventually and by accident rather than by intention was to earn her living by writing the core of which must be sound structure one thing by choice left out of the plan i carried from high school was marriage i would never marry it would interfere with my plan it would fetter my freedom i didn't know quite what freedom meant certainly i was far from realizing that it exists only in the spirit never in human relations never in human activities that the road to it is as often as not what men call bondage but above all i must be free and to be free i must be a spinster when i was fourteen i was praying god on my knees to keep me from marriage i suspect that it was only an echo of the strident feminine cry filling the air at that moment the cry that woman was a slave in a man-made world by the time i was ready to go to college i had changed my prayer for freedom to a will to freedom such was the baggage i carried to college where i was soon to find several things i had not counted on End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. A Coeducational College of the Eighties. When I entered Allegheny College in the fall of 1876, I made my first contact with the past. I had been born and reared a pioneer. I knew only the beginning of things the making of a home in the wilderness, the making of an industry from the ground up i had seen the hardships of beginnings the joy of realization the attacks that success must expect but of things with a past things that had made themselves permanent i knew nothing it struck me full in the face now for this was an old college as things west of the alleghanies were reckoned an old college in an old town here was history and i had never met it before to recognize it the town lay in the valley of a tributary of the allegheny river french creek its oldest tradition after the tales of indians was that george washington once drank from a spring on the edge of the campus certainly he passed that way in seventeen fifty three when he came up the river valley from fort duquesne pittsburgh following the route which led to fort le Boeuf near lake erie he comments in his diary published the year after his trip on the extensive rich meadows through which he had passed one of which i believe was nearly four miles in length and considerable wider in some places to this particular rich meadow a few years later came one david mead and laid out a town and sold land here soon after came the representative of the holland land company colonizers of first quality good men came distinguished names in pennsylvania's history and they wanted a college the answer to their wish came in eighteen fifteen when one of the most scholarly men of that day timothy alden of massachusetts heard their call and picking up all his worldly possessions made the two months trip by coach and boat to the settlement called meadville timothy alden like many of his fellows was fired by a deep belief that through christian democracy alone could men arrive at the better world towards which he scholar that he was knew they had been groping from their earliest beginnings but men could only come to an understanding of their individual and collective responsibilities to democracy through education therefore as men spread westward he and others like him must follow them with education but once in meadville how little he found with which to carry out his project a log courthouse for a schoolhouse and little or no money though of what they had men gave freely now timothy allen knew that throughout the east were men of scholarly traditions convinced as was he that democracy would only work if men were trained to understanding and sacrifice he believed that they would help his western venture in eighteen sixteen he went east to find out he was not wrong in thinking there would be sympathy for the young college 
out of their meagre store men gave this one fifty cents that one five dollars few more and men gave books one two five the list of donors now in the college archives shows many of the best-known names of the day lowell adams tucker parkman channing in boston and twenty-nine fine new york names friends were made for allegheny in every town and city where its brave story was told timothy alden came back with three hundred and sixty-one dollars in money and with books more needed than money estimated to be worth one thousand six hundred forty two dollars twenty six cents from that time he kept the undertaking steadily before the east promoted it by every method known to the times a great response to his passionate effort came in eighteen nineteen when the college world of the east was shocked by learning that william bentley of salem massachusetts had left his famous collection of classical and theological books dictionaries lexicons and bibles to a college in the wilderness of northwestern pennsylvania a college without a home still doing its work in a log courthouse that gift long a bitter drop in the cup of harvard it is said made a home of its own necessity for allegheny and in eighteen twenty the cornerstone of bentley hall named for the donor was laid it took many years to complete it but when done on the lines timothy alden had himself laid down it was one of the most beautiful buildings in the country Today it easily stands after independence hall as the most perfect piece of colonial architecture in the state of pennsylvania for me bentley hall was an extraordinary experience it was the first really beautiful building i had seen a revelation something i had never dreamed of fifty-six years had passed since the cornerstone of bentley hall was laid and not one of them without disappointments and sacrifices more than once it had seemed as if the brave attempt must fail two buildings only had been added in these years culver hall a frame boarding-house for men ruder hall a grim uncompromising three-story rectangular brick structure fifty by ninety feet in size a perfect reflection of the straitened period to which it belonged the factory was our slighting name for ruder hall but in this stern structure i was to find a second deep satisfaction the library in a room on the top floor ninety feet long and at least sixteen in height was housed not only the splendid bentley collection but one even more valuable that of judge james winthrop of cambridge massachusetts rare volumes from the great presses of europe three tons of books brought overland in wagons by boston teamsters in eighteen twenty two they lined the great unbroken inside wall as well as every space between openings from the window seats one looked out on the town in the valley its roofs and towers half hidden by a wealth of trees and beyond to a circle of round-breasted hills before i left allegheny i had found a very precious thing in that severe room the companionship there is in the silent presence of books allegheny did not of course admit women at the start but the ferment caused by the passing of the fourteenth amendment making it clear that only men were to be regarded as citizens stirred the allegheny constituents mightily its chief patron as i have said was the methodist church now the methodist church was a militant reformer the greatest of its bishops matthew simpson had backed mrs stanton and miss anthony and their colleagues at every step leaders among methodist women had been abolitionists aggressive temperance advocates and now they became militant suffragists their influence began to tell in eighteen seventy with misgivings in not a few minds the admission of women was voted this was the same year that the university of michigan opened its doors to women and two years before cornell in the six years before i entered ten women had graduated when i came there were but two seniors two juniors no sophomores i was a lone freshman in a class of forty hostile or indifferent boys 
the friendly and facetious professor charged with the care of the young ladies put it that i was lost in the wilderness of boy from the first i was dimly conscious that i was an invader that there was abroad a spirit of masculinity challenging my right to be there and there were taboos not to be disregarded my first experience was that of which virginia woolf speaks so bitterly in a room of one's own the closing of the college green to her at oxbridge nearly fifty years before her book was written i was having at allegheny the same experience the sloping green of the campus below bentley hall was inviting between classes i made my way one day to a seat under a tree only to hear a horrified call from the walk above come back come back quick an imperative summons from an upper-class woman you mustn't go on that side of the walk only men go there it was not so simple to find a spot where you could go and be comfortable if bentley hall where all the classes were held was a beautiful piece of architecture its interior could hardly have been more severe the rooms were heated with pot-bellied cast-iron stoves seated with the hardest wooden chairs lighted by kerosene lamps in winter and the winters were long the snow tracked in kept the floors wet and cold often one wore a muffler in chapel but of all that i was unheeding my pioneer childhood served me well moreover i realized at the start that i had found what i had come to college for direction in the only field in which i was interested science I found it in a way that I doubt if Cornell could have given me at the moment, shy and immature as I was, the warming and contagious enthusiasm of a great natural teacher, one who had an ardent passion for those things which had stirred me, and a wide knowledge which he fed by constant study and travel. Jeremiah Tingley, the head of Allegheny's Department of Natural Science. Professor Tingley was then a man of fifty sparkling alive informal three years before he had been one of the fifty chosen from many hundred applicants to spend the summer with louis agassiz on the island of penikes in buzzards bay agassiz had planned with enthusiasm for the penikes summer school and for those privileged to enter who could understand and appreciate it it was an unforgettable experience certainly it was for jeremiah tingley he carried there Agassiz's faith in observation and classification, as well as his reverence for nature and all her ways. For both men, the material world was but the cover of the spirit. Professor Tingley would quote Agassiz sometimes, Nature always brings us back to absolute truth whenever we wander. This fervent faith had a profound and quieting effect on my religious tumult. I learned a new word, pantheism. Being still in that early stage of development where there must be a definite word by which to classify oneself, I began to call myself a pantheist, and I had a creed which I repeated more often than the creed I had learned in childhood. Flower in the crannied wall, I pluck you out of the crannies. I hold you here, root and all, in my hand. Little flower, but if i could understand what you are root and all and all in all i should know what god and man is it reassured me i was on the right track for was i not going to find out with the microscope what god and man are professor tingley's method for those he found really interested in scientific study was to encourage them to look outside the book there was where i had already found my joy but i suspected it was the wilful way that the true way was to know first what was in the books here in professor tinkley's classes you were ordered to go and see for yourself he used to tell us a story of his first experience at penikes a stone was put before him a round water-washed stone on which he was to report he looked at the stone turned it over there was nothing to report it is not on the outside it is the inside of things that matters said agassiz and in the laboratory that became our watchword look inside 
discovering my interest in the microscope i was not only allowed i was urged to use the magnificent binocular belonging to the college was given the free run of the laboratory along with a few as crazy as myself here my most exciting adventure apart from what i found under the microscope came from actually having my hands on a missing link evolution to which i was clinging determinedly could only be established i realized by discovering the links there was one peculiar to the waters in our valley the memopomo alleganiensis a creature twelve to fifteen inches long with gills and one lung able to live in the water or mud as circumstances required the mud puppy as it was appropriately called was slimy loathsome but i worked over it with awe was i not being admitted into the very workshop of nature herself seeing how she did it professor tingley took his little group of laboratory devotees into his home circle he and mrs tingley were housed in a wing of bentley hall big rooms built for classrooms they had no children and in the years of their study and travel they had gathered about them things of beauty and interest the atmosphere of those rooms was something quite new and wonderful to me it was my first look into the intimate social life possible to people interested above all in ideas beauty music and glad to work hard and live simply to devote themselves to their cultivation and such good talks most of it was concerned with fresh scientific thought the inventions and discoveries which were stirring the world an omnivorous reader of the scientific publications of europe and america professor tingley kept us excited not only by what had been done but what it might mean there was the telephone i had been in college but a few weeks when my father asked me to go with him and my brother to the centennial exposition of eighteen seventy six president bugby who had made me his special care for a time mrs bugby even taking me into their home until an appropriate boarding-place could be found was heartily in favor of my going i went and when i returned professor tingley's first question was did you see the telephone i hadn't even heard of it two exhibits only of that exposition made a deep enough impression on me to last until today my first corot and the corliss engine professor tingley was greatly disappointed and i did not understand why until a few weeks later he called the student body together to explain and illustrate the telephone by a home-made instrument you'll talk to your homes from these rooms one day he told us new york will talk to boston he didn't suggest chicago dreamer the boys said dreamer my father and his titusville friends said a little later when an agent of the bell associates the first company to attempt putting the new invention within reach of everybody came to town selling stock how often i heard it said later if i'd bought that telephone stock years later i told alexander graham bell of my introduction to the telephone nobody he said can estimate what the teachers of science in colleges and high schools were doing in those days not only to spread knowledge of the telephone but to stir youth to tackle the possibilities in electricity what i best remember is not the telephone but professor tingley's amazing enthusiasm for the telephone this revelation of enthusiasm its power to warm and illuminate was one of the finest and most lasting of my college experiences the people i had known teachers preachers doctors business men all went through their day's work either with a stubborn often sullen determination to do their whole duty or with an undercurrent of uneasiness as if they found pleasure in duty they seemed to me to feel that they were not really working if they were not demonstrating the puritan teaching that labor is a curse it had never seemed so to me but i did not dare gloat over it and here was a teacher who did gloat over his job in all its ramifications moreover he did his best to stir you to share his joy but while i looked on what i was learning in the laboratory as what i had come to college for 
while each term stiffened my ambition to go deeper and deeper into the search for the original atom science was not all that interested me the faculty if small was made up largely of seasoned men with a perspective on life there was not only deep seriousness but humor and tolerance and since we were so small a college the student was close enough to discover them to find out what each man as an individual had to offer him as i learned the power of enthusiasm from jeremiah tingley i learned from another man of that faculty the value of contempt holding the chair of latin was one of the few able teachers i have known george haskins father of that sound scholar of international repute the late charles homer haskins at the time of his death professor emeritus of medieval history at harvard university what deep satisfaction his career gave his father himself a man of many disappointments george haskin labored usually in vain to arouse to us the choiceness of latinity the meaning of rome's rise and fall the quality of her men the relation of that life to ours professor haskin's contempt for our lack of understanding for our slack preparation was something utterly new to me in human intercourse the people i knew with rare exceptions spared one another's feelings i had come to consider that a superior grace you must be kind if you lied for it but here was a man who turned on indifference neglect carelessness with bitter and caustic contempt left his victim seared the sufferers lived to say some of them at least i deserved it he was never unjust never inappreciative of effort cherish your contempts henry james advised me once when he had drawn from me a confession of the conflict between my natural dislike of saying anything unpleasant about anybody and the necessity of being cruel even brutal if the work i had undertaken was to be truthful in fact and logic cherish your contempts said mr james and strength to your elbow if it had not been for george haskins i doubt if i should have known what he meant nor should i ever have become the steady rather dogged worker i am the contempt for shiftlessness which he inspired in me aroused a determination to be a good worker i began to train my mind to go at its task regularly keep hours study whether i liked a thing or not i forced myself not to waste time not to loaf not to give up before i finished if i failed at any point in this discipline i suffered a certain mental and spiritual malaise a dissatisfaction with myself hard to live with in spite of my painful efforts to make a regular worker out of myself life at college was lightened by my discovery of the boy incredible as it seems to me now i had come to college at eighteen without ever having dared to look fully into the face of any boy of my age to be sure i had from childhood nourished secret passions for a succession of older individuals whom i never saw except at a distance and with whom i never exchanged a word my brother and his friends my father and his friends these i had always hobnobbed with but those who naturally should have been my companions i shunned i was unable to take part in those things that brought the young people of the day together i did not dance the methodist discipline forbade it i was incredibly stupid and uninterested in games still am i had no easy companionable ways was too shy to attempt them i had my delights the hills which i ran the long drives behind our little white horse the family doings the reading of french regularly with my splendid friend annette grombin still living still as she was then a vitalizing influence in the town and state for all that makes for a higher social life these things and my precious evening walks the full length of titusville's main street alone or with some girl-friend while we talked of things deepest in our minds but in all this there was no boy i was not long in discovering him when i reached allegheny for the taboos i encountered at the start soon yielded under the increased number of women 
women in college, in special courses, in the preparatory department. They swept masculine prohibitions out of the way, took possession, made a different kind of institution of it, less scholastic, gayer, easier going. The daily association in the classrooms, the contacts and appraisements, the mutual interests and intimacies, the continual procession of college doings which, in the nature of things, required that you should have a masculine attendant, soon put me at my ease. I was learning, learning fast, but the learning carried its pains. I still had a stiff-necked determination to be free. To avoid entangling alliances of all kinds had become an obsession with me. I was slow in laying it aside when I began to take part in the social life of the college, and because of it, I was guilty of one performance which was, properly enough, a scandal to the young men. There were several men's fraternities in the college. Most of the boys belonged to one or another. It was an ambition of the fraternities to put their pins on acceptable town and college girls. You were a Delta girl or a Gamma girl or a Phi Psi girl. I resented this effort to tag me. Why should I not have friends in all the fraternities? And I had. I accumulated four pins, and then, one disastrous morning, went into chapel with the four pins on my coat. There were a few months after that when, if it had not been for two or three non-frat friends, I should have been a social outcast. I spent four years in Allegheny College. Measured by what I got instead of by what I did not get and was obliged to learn later, I regard them as among the most profitable of my life. I find often that men and women accuse the college of not opening their minds to life as it is in the world. For a mind sufficiently developed to see life as it is, I cannot conceive a more fruitful field than the classics. If I had been sufficiently mature, I could have learned from George Haskins' teachings of Cicero and Tacitus and Livy more than I know today about the ways of men in their personal and their national relations, more of the causes of war, of the weaknesses of governments. But I was not ready for it. Life is the great teacher, and she leads us step by step. It is not the fault of the human teacher that his pupil must learn to climb by climbing. It was in the spring of 1880 that I graduated. I still carried the same baggage with which I had entered. A little heavier, to be sure, a little better packed, a little better adapted to the purpose. The only difference which threatened disturbance was that I had added an item which I had refused to bring with me in 1876. Then I was not willing to believe I would ever marry. Now I thought possibly some day I might. But the item was not heavy, not heavy enough at least to prevent my rejoicing over the fact that I was graduating with a job. I had signed a contract with an institution of which I had never heard until the negotiations leading to it opened. After frequent communications with the faculty, a representative of the Poland Union Seminary of Poland, Ohio, with some misgivings, had employed me to serve as its preceptress. Five hundred dollars a year and board yourself. I was jubilant. It meant economic independence, the first plank in my platform. I would use my leisure to work with the microscope. I would save my money. I would one day go abroad and study with some great biologist. I would never abandon my search for the beginning of life, the point where I expected to find God. It was then with entire confidence in the future that I started out, in August of 1880, for the town of Poland, on the Western Reserve of Ohio, to begin what women were then talking of in more or less odd tones, as a career. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Start and a Retreat If I had been going on my honeymoon, I should scarcely have been more expectant, or more curious, than I was in August of 1880 when I left home to take my first position, preceptress of Poland Union Seminary, Poland, 
Mahoning County, Ohio, $500 a year and board yourself. Poland was not a long journey from my home, four or five hours. I found the village delightful. It had the air of having been long in existence, as it had. Here there was no noise of railroads, no sign of the coal and steel and iron industries which encircled it, but had never passed its boundaries. Here all people seemed to me to live tranquilly in roomy houses with pleasant yards, or on nearby farms, where there were fine horses and fat-blooded sheep, and where planting and harvesting went ahead year in and year out, in orderly fashion. The chief and only industry of Poland was its seminary, now about thirty years old. It was a community enterprise started in 1848 by Mr. B. F. Lee, the financial agent who had hired me. Everybody in the village had subscribed to its endowment. Practically every church had, at one time or another, been its patron. The long depression of the seventies had crippled its finances sadly. But times were better now, and the well-to-do Presbytery of Mahoney County had agreed to take it under its care but I was soon to learn that Poland Union Seminary, in spite of the patronage of the Presbytery, lived on a narrow and worn shoestring. Moreover, I at once divined, kind as those were who were responsible for my being there, that I had been injected into a situation of which Mr. Lee had given me no hint strong enough to penetrate my inexperience. It was serious enough, as on the very day the school bell first rang for me, the villagers began to let me know. Men and women would stop me on the street to say, So, it's you that's taking Miss Blakely's place. You have no idea how badly we feel about her resigning. I went to school to her. My father and mother went to school to her. I had hoped all my children would go to her. She was a wonderful teacher, a beautiful character. You look pretty young. You haven't had much experience, have you? I was not long in learning that the devotion of the community to Miss Blakely was deserved. The village was right in honoring her, in mourning her. It no doubt felt a certain satisfaction in letting me know at the start it in no way regarded me as an adequate substitute. Its insistence was such that, before the end of my first fortnight, I was ready to resign. My morale would hardly have been so quickly shaken if I had not at once discovered, to my consternation, that there was an important part of my duties which was in danger of proving too much for me. The worst of it was that it concerned the largest block of pupils in an institution where every pupil counted, where Mr. Lee regarded it as of vital importance that every pupil be given what he wanted. Here, he advertised, you could prepare for college. Here you could have special advanced work in anything you wanted. And Mr. Lee was right, if the seminary was to live as a cog in the country's educational wheel. Somebody ought to write, perhaps somebody has written, of the passing of this once valuable institution. It came before the college and the high school, and for a time did the work of both. But when the high school began to prepare students for the college, and the colleges added preparatory departments, and at the same time offered special courses, the seminary slowly realized that it must either go out of business or combine with one or another of its healthy, growing rivals. In a few places, as in Poland Village, the seminary was hanging on tenaciously, trying to demonstrate that it was still a better man than these new undertakings, these high schools, these colleges with their preparatory schools. The faculty which was to make the demonstration at Poland was made up of three persons, in order of rank, the president, the preceptress, her assistant. The acting president insisted on all the perquisites of his title. His chief duty he regarded as conducting the chapel, with more or less grandiloquent remarks. When my assistant and I complained of too much work, he would scowl and say that his executive duties made it impossible for him to take on more classes. The result was that I started out with two classes in each of four languages, Greek, Latin, French, and German, as well as classes in geology, botany, geometry, trigonometry. In addition, there was my threatened Waterloo, the two largest classes in the school. 
one in what was called verb grammar the other percentage arithmetic so named from the points in the textbooks where the term's work began from time immemorial these two classes had been conducted in the interests of the district school teachers of the territory it was the custom for these teachers to spend one term a year in the seminary where regardless of the number of years they had been teaching the number of times they had treated themselves to a period of study they always so i was told insisted on their verb grammar and their percentage arithmetic it was like a ritual as they were the numerical backbone of the institution there was nothing so important in the judgment of the management as their satisfaction it was a killing schedule for one person but i was so eager so ridiculously willing so excited and also so fresh from college that i did not know it indeed as i look back on it i think i did fairly well all things considered i should have had no great alarm about my success if it had not been for the grammar and the arithmetic from the first day i realized i was on ground there which once familiar was now almost unintelligible i could and did teach my geometry and trig with relish i could and did pilot fairly advanced classes in four languages so that the pupils at least never discovered that in one of them i was far beyond my depth and that in all of them at times i knew myself to be skating on thin ice but these district school teachers several of them older than i were not to be deceived or bluffed they had had experience i had not and like the villagers of poland they proposed to make me realize that no college diploma could make up for inexperience experience in percentage arithmetic and verb grammar came from doing the same examples and diagramming and parsing the same sentences year after year and going back to teach them in their communities many of these examples were tricky many of the sentences were ambiguous they had learned solutions for both solutions which had the backing of tradition i was soon terrified lest i be trapped so scared i would wake up in the night in cold sweats this was my state of mind when one day the most important man in the village robert walker the local banker stopped me on the street sis he said he was to always call me sis sis you are following a fine teacher i could have wept the same old story but don't worry what you must do is keep a stiff upper lip oh thank you sir i said as i hurried on lest i cry in the street but that keep a stiff upper lip coming from the man it did restored me and i resolved cost what it would to find a way to master my district school teachers true it took me two months to discover the weak place in their armor finally i learned they were solving problems and parsing sentences not according to principles but according to answers they had learned the reason they insisted on going over them year after year at the seminary was to keep the solutions in their memory i had no skill in solving puzzles but i did know something about the principles and determined to try them on problems and sentences that were not in their books or any books to which they had access and so one day luckily for me before they had a chance to demonstrate my incapacity as two or three of them i am confident were expecting to do i casually put on the board two or three rather tough examples from outside arithmetics two or three not simple sentences from grammars i felt sure they had never seen i always recall with satisfaction the perplexity with which the two or three young men i most feared looked at what i had set for them their injured protest but those examples are not in our books what difference does that make the only important thing is that you know the principles if you can't apply them why learn them after a month of excursions into territory unfamiliar to them i had them humbled and slowly grasping certain new ideas i knew i was regarded with respect it was the one conquest in the two years i spent as the preceptress of the poland union seminary of which i was proud before these two years were up 
mr lee must have realized he would never get from me the help he needed in his ambition to preserve the school as a seminary that i would never become another miss blakely he wanted someone ambitious to make teaching a life work i was not teaching was a mere stepping stone in my plan of life and at poland union seminary it had proved a slippery stone from the time i bounded out of bed in the morning for in those days i did bound out of bed until i dropped into it at an early hour dead tired i had no time for my microscope it had become dusty on the table but the passion for it and what it might reveal was still strong in me my confidence that i could save money to continue my studies on five hundred dollars a year had proved illusory i found myself coming out short obliged to borrow from my father there came to be a mutual if unspoken agreement between mr lee and me that i should resign neither of us was getting what he had hoped and so at the end of the second school year june eighteen eighty two i gave up teaching as a stepping stone so far as i could then see or did see for a long time this first effort in an independent self-directing life was an interlude which had no relation to what i wanted at the time to do or what as it turned out i did do the most lasting impressions and experiences in this poland interlude had little or nothing to do with my work in the seminary they came from the friendships i formed while that work went on centering in the family of the understanding gentleman who had at the outset stopped me on the street to say keep a stiff upper lip i was soon to realize that this shrewd bit of advice was instigated by his daughter clara who was to become and who remains one of my dearest friends indeed it was due to her understanding and affection that my two years in poland quite apart from the professional disappointment in them were the gayest most interesting and in many ways the happiest of my life up to that time clara walker or dot as high and low in and about poland called her was a fine example of the out-of-door girl of the eighties the girl who had revolted against lacing high heels long skirts and substituted for them an admirable uniform of independence tailor-made coat and skirt high-necked shirt-waist with four-in-hand tie flat heels this outfit suited clara walker's sturdy figure her vigorous and free movement her eyes suited her costume for they were gray direct merry looking unwaveringly on everybody and everything dot was close-mouthed but when she sensed possible unfairness in a situation which interested or concerned her she had her own wordless way of dealing with it it was she who realized the determination of the villagers of poland to make me feel that i could never fill miss blakely's place to their satisfaction she was loyal as they to the old teacher but she wanted me to have my chance and the first week of school announced herself my champion by appearing at the door of the seminary as i was making my weary way out at the end of the day wouldn't you like to take a drive she said and there stood her smart turnout what an escape from verb grammar and percentage arithmetic and my growing inferiority complex from that time she never lagged in her determination to help me conquer my problem by taking me away from it she apparently took real pleasure in showing me the country never a week that we did not go somewhere into town for the theatre the first time i saw mary anderson then the most beloved actress as well as the most beautiful woman in the country was in youngstown in pygmalion to big farms with great flocks of blooded sheep and horses and ponies to coal mines and iron mills to little old towns and run-down settlements skipped like poland by the invasion of industry clara peopled all these various places with the unadorned realistic tales of living and dead men and women she had been born and had grown up in mahoning county she had a widely scattered family connection but most important was her genuine interest in all human beings and theirs in her she was a perfect listener never prying people liked to talk to her she never forgot related things 
judged shrewdly and kindly with the result that she had in her mind a map of the human life of the country quite as reliable as a road map a map in warm humorous colors years later i realized that in those two years in poland i had had under my eyes a vivid picture of what happens to the farmer his home his town his children when industry invades his land this mahoning country had been so rich so apparently stable the men and women so loved what they and their forebears had done that they yielded slowly to the coal miner and the mill man but they were giving way in the eighties the furnace was in the back yard of the fine old houses with their ample barns and the shaft of the coal mine in the richest meadows the effort to reconcile the two was making but industry was conquering the destruction of beauty the breaking down of standards of conduct the growth of the love of money for money's sake the grist of social problems facing the countryside from the inflow of foreigners and the instability of work all this was written for him who could read i could not read them but i gathered a few impressions which i realize now helped shape my future interests and thinking it was on these long drives i first learned that not cities alone but all communities have dregs slums strange that it should be in such a place as poland but here it was a disreputable fringe where a group of men and women had long been living together with or without marriage you heard strange tales of incest and lust of complete moral and social irresponsibility and they were having a scandalously jolly time of it why i was not more shocked i do not know probably because incest and lust were almost unknown words to me in those days and there were indelible impressions of the industrial world when we drove into youngstown ten miles away we passed between iron furnaces lying along the mahoning river after the long depression of the seventies they were again busy and into the valley were coming hundreds and hundreds of foreigners brought from europe by the news that there was once again work in the united states it was in passing through the very heart of this furnace district one night returning from the theatre that i first learned of the terrible dangers that lie in the smelting of ore a furnace had burst men had been trapped by the molten metal and their charred remains were being carried across the road unforgettable horror and it was on one of these chance drives that i first saw what women can do in moments of frenzied protest against situations which they cannot control first had my faith challenged in the universally peaceful nature of my sex i learned the meaning of maenads furies as we came upon a maddened threatening crowd rushing towards the offices of the mills which had been shut down without warning it was led by big robust shrieking women their hair flying their clothes dishevelled it was a look into a world of which i knew nothing but like the charred bodies carried across the road as i rode from the theatre it was an unforgettable thing there were other introductions to the industrial world less horrifying it was while in poland that i first went into a coal mine a deep old-fashioned coal mine a subsidiary to a farm under some of these great farms with their blooded sheep their fine orchards and fields their horses and ponies coal had been found and it was being mined as a sideline of the farm a new kind of crop near the head of the shaft were little houses for the miners and when dull times came and the mine was shut down the farmers took on their care there was a slaughter of an immense number of pigs the putting down of barrels of pork the smokings of an incredible number of hams the making of sausages and head cheese but why why all this i asked oh said my hostess mining is unstable business when there are long shutdowns we must help the miners out see that they have food the intimacy with dot walker gave me a home mrs walker treated me as a daughter and as for robert walker who still called me sis he liked to have me around and to give me a word of wise counsel now and then it is because in those months i learned him to be as kindly shrewd 
honest, simple-minded a man, as I have ever known, that I must interrupt my narrative long enough to put in here the story of one of the cruelest episodes of which I personally have known in the fifty years that I have been a more or less understanding observer of our national political life. The story is of Robert Walker and his one-time friend, William McKinley, the twenty-fifth president of the United States. When I became an intimate of the Walker household, a person I often heard mentioned by its head was the Major, Major McKinley. Now, it was not, in 1880, a name unfamiliar to me. I had met it already at Allegheny College, where McKinley had once been a student. When the Civil War broke out, he had joined the exodus of students who had volunteered at the first call. He had come out of the war a major, studied law, and settled in Canton, Ohio, only sixty or seventy miles from Poland, and in the same congressional district. Here, in 1876, the Mahoning District, as it was called, had sent him to Congress. It was a matter of interest in Allegheny in my time to have one of its former students turn out a congressman, its usual crop being teachers, preachers, and missionaries. When I came to Poland, I learned quickly that McKinley had lived there as a boy, had attended the seminary, and was their proudest example of the boy who had made good. For four years he had been their congressman. How they boasted of him! How solidly they voted for him! I was not long in the Walker household before I sensed something more in Robert Walker than a citizen's pride in McKinley. It was that species of adoration a modest, honest-minded man often has for his leader, the leader who can do no wrong. I realized this when I first saw them together. The Major had come to our seminary commencement in June of 1881. I remember nothing at all of the speech he made, but the scene on the wide green in front of the village church after the exercises were over remains vivid. Scattered about were scores upon scores of girls and women in the frilly white gowns, the long white feather boas, the flower-trimmed hats, the gay parasols of the period. And in and out wound the major, shaking hands, smiling, exchanging friendly greetings. All together at home. No back-slapping, no kissing of babies. It was all so gentle, so like a picture of an English garden party, where the politics are hidden beneath the finest of social veneers. And there was Robert Walker most effulgent. Well, sis, he asked me later, what do you think of the major? A remark to which he expected no answer. What answer other than his could there be? What I did not know then was that from the beginning of William McKinley's political career, Robert Walker had been his chief, and for a time I think his only, financial backer. Beginning with his first campaign for Congress in 1875, Mr. Walker had advanced the Major $2,000 for expenses. He continued equal advances before each successive campaign, the understanding that $1,000 a year was to be paid on the debt. Along with this financial support went a staunch support of all the Major's political ideas. These ideas were those of the Republican Party, and for men like Robert Walker, the party was hallowed. It was the party of Lincoln. Loyalty to Lincoln required loyalty to all that was directly or indirectly connected with him. Is Robert Lincoln a dude? One of my Mahoning County acquaintances asked me years later, when I told him that I had been talking with Robert Lincoln about his father. Is he a dude? By which he meant, as I took it, a kind of Ward McAllister. No, no, not that, I assured him. Well, he said reflectively, even if he was a dude, I would vote for him for president, because he is Abraham Lincoln's son. The chief test of loyalty to the party of Lincoln in Ohio was the degree of support given to the high protective tariff. William McKinley's support was devout and unqualified. He looked on a duty so low that it allowed importations as a species of treason. There was tin plate, for example. The year that I went to Poland, 1880, McKinley first espoused a duty on tin plate. There was strong opposition among iron and steel manufacturers. 
they felt they already had all they could look after in congress but when they told this to mckinley his answer was that unless they supported tin plate he would not support their tariffs naturally they yielded and tin plate was added to their list of proteges mckinley felt so sure of ultimate victory for the duty that he evidently did not hesitate to advise his friends to get ready for its coming at all events he encouraged robert walker suggested to him in fact that he establish in youngstown ohio a stamping plant for the making of tinware taking with him as partner his brother-in-law andrew j duncan as Andrew Duncan had no money to invest, the Major gave to Mr. Walker a sheaf of signed notes, to be used whenever he had need of money. Now Robert Walker was not a manufacturer. He was a farmer, and a good one, a coal operator, the banker of the village of Poland in the surrounding country. But it was not in Robert Walker's nature to refuse to help the Major, or his relatives, in their ambitions, as he had already frequently proved indeed at that time he was backing mckinley's brother abner in a business venture which was soon to fail with loss of all he had put in but robert walker's faith in mckinley's wisdom was such that he could not conceive of failure in anything he advised the plant was started in eighteen ninety there could not have been a more unlucky moment to launch a new industry the long depression of the nineties was beginning iron and steel were already seriously affected money was tight robert walker found himself almost at once forced to use the major's notes he found only too soon that he had embarked on a hopeless undertaking and in february of eighteen ninety three the works were closed now at that moment mark hanna and his colleagues on the national republican committee were counting on william mckinley to win the presidential election for them in eighteen ninety six the announcement that he was involved in the walker failure to the tune of some one hundred thousand dollars more than the combined fortune of himself and wife was a cruel blow to their plan mckinley was straightforward with them he had signed the notes he must give up politics go back to the law and pay his honest debts but that could not be permitted he was too important one hundred thousand dollars was a small sum compared to what the republican committee expected from his election the money was raised not so quietly it became necessary to explain how mckinley had become involved to this amount and the explanation which mckinley's political friends put out was that he was a victim of a man named walker as mark hanna's able biographer herbert crowley calls him a man whom he had trusted and who deceived him as to the amount of money he was raising on his notes that is the republican committee deliberately put on robert walker the stigma of fraud presented him to the public as a man who had betrayed confidence and William McKinley never denied their presentation. I have it from Robert Walker and from his daughter that no note of William McKinley was ever cashed without consulting him, and I believe them. Moreover, Andrew Duncan was in this enterprise and knew what was going on. It is an interesting fact that when my friend Clara Walker, who kept the accounts for the McKinleys and her father, went the morning after the announcement of the failure to her office in Youngstown, all her books had disappeared, along with many papers which belonged to the firm. I had been living abroad for two years when all this happened, but just before I had left America, I had talked with Robert Walker about his venture, the money he was trying to raise on McKinley's notes his confidence was untarnished the major knows sis he will see this thing through i'd do anything to back him and he did when i returned to see my friends i found they had given up practically everything and robert walker himself was utterly broken by the ignominy heaped on him i begged him to give me his side of the story let me tell it told him i would never rest until i had an opportunity to put down what i knew of his long support of the major's ambitions what i believed of him as a man of unselfish integrity he absolutely and finally refused nobody would ever believe the major could do anything wrong i didn't 
but the major had allowed the oldest and most loyal friend he had in his public life to be ruined not only in fortune but in reputation now that robert walker and mrs walker are both gone and reviving the episode can no longer give them pain it gives me a certain solace to put down the story as i believe it i was leaving poland but what was i to do to-day with my passion for the microscope still undimmed i would naturally seek a place in one of the many laboratories now open to women hundreds of women in the country bent on scientific research are now in industrial institutional or governmental laboratories but in eighteen eighty two there was almost nothing of that kind open to women the change is due first to the tremendous advance in scientific research second to the way women have proved their adaptability to laboratory work no doubt the great majority of them are like the majority of women in offices laboratory wives but we have inspired workers among them probably all things considered as large a proportion as among men if things had been as they were in eighteen seventy six when i asked my father if he could put me through college and he had so cheerfully and happily i think agreed i could have asked to be financed for higher studies but things were not as they had been and it would have been quite out of the question in eighteen eighty two when i decided that my first step towards economic independence was mistaken for him to finance me the country was coming into a new depression that of eighty three and eighty four and the oil business was in a serious state for those who produced the oil but my home was open wide open i think it was this fact that is at the bottom of my strong conviction that the home is an essential link in the security of men and women after one has gone forth on his own there frequently comes a time when he is shelterless as far as his own resources go to have a refuge of which he is sure is one of the most heartening and stabilizing experiences in a life if my poland venture was a failure professionally it did not throw me on the street i had a place to go and think it over when i asked my mother if it would be all right for me to come home her answer was what it was always to be in the future when i was obliged more than once to make the request of course that is your right that is my father and mother looked on the home they had created not as something belonging only to them a place they had for their comfort and privacy it was a place for all of those in the family procession who had no other place to go in turn i saw that home open to grandmother and grandfather aunts and uncles children and grandchildren quite regardless of the extra burden it put on their resources limitations on their space the irritations and complications that are always bred by the injection of extra persons however beloved and close into a settled group it was june eighteen eighty two that i went back home dusted my desk in the tower room now shared with my sister's playhouse and dolls set up my microscope and went to work on the hydrozoa but not for long end of chapter four Chapter Five of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A fresh start, a second retreat. It was the custom of the Tarbell household to do its part in entertaining the Methodist ministers and presiding elders who periodically filled the pulpit of our church. In the winter after my return from the Poland venture, we had a guest, an important local personage, Dr. Theodore L. Flood a preacher who had retired from active ministry to take the editorship of a magazine called the chautauquan published in the town thirty miles from titusville where i had so recently spent four years meadville the home of allegheny college on this visit dr flood asked me to help him out for a month or two in a new department in his magazine i was quick to accept glad to be useful for i had grown up with what was called the chautauqua movement indeed it had been almost as much a part of my life as the oil business and in its way it was as typically american if we had a truer measure for values we would count it more important 
This Chautauqua movement had grown out of a Methodist camp meeting held annually at Fair Point, on the pleasant lake which, in my childhood, had been the terminus of our most ambitious all-day excursions. The president of this association, by 1870, was a man justly respected in all that part of the world for his good deeds as well as his business acumen, Lewis Miller, a manufacturer of Akron, Ohio. Mr. Miller was to be known nationally as the father-in-law of Thomas Edison, but old-time Chautauquans put it the other way. Edison is Lewis Miller's son-in-law. That was enough recommendation for Edison in their minds. Lewis Miller's interest in Chautauqua went beyond the annual camp meeting. He saw the opportunity to build up there a summer home, where parents could give their children healthy out-of-door amusement, protection from the evil ways of the unregenerate, and sound modern instruction in the Bible. Sympathy with this program induced a half-dozen families in the Titusville Methodist Church to join in the purchase of a lot on the outskirts of the grounds and start a Titusville settlement a cottage with a mess hall and a few rooms, tents serving as sleeping quarters for extras. Father joined the colony soon after we moved to Titusville. We had a tent and a flat-bottomed boat. Through the years I have been recalling, the years in high school, college, as preceptress of Poland Union Seminary, part of all my summers had been spent at Chautauqua. Lewis Miller's laudable attempt to furnish attractive instruction in the Bible meant little or nothing to me at first. The flat-bottomed boat meant a great deal. But in 1874, something happened that dragged me away from the water. Lewis Miller had persuaded the most eminent advocate of the Sunday school in America, Dr., afterwards Bishop, John H. Vincent, to select Fairpoint as the home of a national, interdenominational Sunday school institute, which he and those who saw with him had been for some time planning. The first session of this new organization was held in 1874, under the name of the Chautauqua Assembly. It was recognized at once as a revolution upsetting the old order. The most spectacular feature of the revolution was the Chautauqua platform, making, as it did, stirring, challenging contacts with current intellectual life. There, one heard the great speakers of the day on all sorts of subjects. There, fine concerts were given. It was the scientific lectures which caught me, particularly those of Dr. R. Ogden de Ramus of New York. His platform experiments, in which two skillful women assisted, excited me as I had never been before but what aroused me most were certain demonstrations with a magnificent microscope, which they were giving in a little building at one side. Nothing in the world seemed to matter to me so much as to be able to talk with these women, to ask their advice about the work I was beginning with the little instrument bought with my own carefully saved money. Perhaps, oh perhaps, I dreamed, they would let me look through the great beauty they handled so deftly. Focus it, Watch the life which went on in its field. So one day I hung around after the talk was over, slipped up to them, steeled myself to tell them that I was going to be a microscopist, begged them to give me a few lessons, advise me. The two ladies smiled down from their height, so plainly showing they thought me a country child with a queer behavior complex. Quite impossible, they said, and turned back to their conference with Dr. Doremus abashed, humiliated, but luckily too angry to cry, I made my way back to my flat-bottomed boat. I would show them, I resolved, clenching my fists. It was years before I attempted again to get from a Chautauqua undertaking more than it was offering to the public at large. There were many of these undertakings. Dr. Vincent saw to that. A man better fitted by experience, conviction, and personality to persuade a half-asleep, wholly satisfied community to accept a new order could not have been found in the America of the eighties. John Vincent was forty-two years old when he came to Chautauqua. Handsome, confident, alert, energetic, radiating well-being. And he was an orator, and orating at Chautauqua made men tolerant even of heresy. He went about his business of organizing the work of the assembly with a skill which commanded the admiration of everybody, 
even those hostile to the secularization of their beloved camp meeting as a platform manager i have never known his equal he had magnetism but he knew when and how to turn it on he was shrewd cunning pungent he pricked bubbles disciplined his audience the chautauqua audience came to be one of the best behaved out-of-door audiences in the country the fact that we were out of doors had persuaded us that we were free to leave meetings if we were bored or suddenly remembered that we had left bread in the oven or that the baby must have wakened when the performance had been stopped once or twice to give that lady a chance to go out without further disturbing the speaker we learned to stay at home or to sit out the lecture there is only one word to describe what lewis miller and dr vincent now did to chautauqua and that is electrification the community was made up mainly of hard-working men and women who wanted a vacation in surroundings where they would not have to worry about the children certainly if high fences with gates through which you could not pass in or out after ten p m never pass without your ticket and not even with one on sundays if watchful guards and ten o'clock curfew if a mass public opinion on the part of elders in support of these restrictions could have suppressed all the mischief and lawlessness in the youth which swarmed chautauqua parents were right in sleeping tranquilly as a matter of fact i never knew of any serious offences though there probably were many which i was still too much of a little girl to recognize the worst mischief in which i personally assisted was playing tag up and down the relief model of palestine which skirted the lake as palestine does the mediterranean it was spotted with plaster of paris models of towns from damascus to bethsaida i remember one rule of our game was that you could not be tagged if you straddled jerusalem the most serious vandalism of which i knew and in which i had no part was stealing Damascus or Nazareth or Tyre and carrying it away bodily. Dr. Vincent did not change the restrictions, but he made them more endurable by the fresh interest he put into our lives. His effect on the community physically was immediate. It began to grow. The sound of the hammers nailing together the, for the most part, flimsy cottages was never still. The result was very like what Mark Twain found in the summer colony of Antiora and the Catskills in its first year. The partition so thin you can hear the women changing their minds. Housekeeping improved. It had been as sketchy as the cottages. Picnic housekeeping. You saw them at it, out in the rear of their cottages, over an old wood stove or stone fireplace. The men in their shirt sleeves, the women in big aprons, if not wrappers planks on sawhorses for tables, mats, we had not learned to say doilies yet, benches for seats. The natural practice of bringing discarded furniture from home to furnish the cottages led to the only distinctive piece of Chautauqua furniture I recall, a long, high-backed bench made from an old-fashioned four-post bedstead. There were few garrets in all the country about Chautauqua that did not harbor one or more such bedsteads they had been hidden away when families could afford the new styled quartered oak or walnut bedroom suites some ingenious mind had seen that by shortening the side pieces of a four-poster to seat width using the headboard for a back you had a commodious and with cushions a comfortable seat even couch they were scattered all over the place with the coming of dr vincent chautauqua rapidly developed a promenade along the south end of the lake front cottages here were lathed and plastered had wicker chairs on their verandas and the residents soon were taking their meals at the really stately athenium hotel it was in this front row that dr and mrs vincent came to live in a tent a tent de luxe with a real house so it looked to us behind it Sometimes, when we were properly dressed and shod, we walked past the hotel and the cottages housing our aristocrats, and if by chance we saw Dr. or Mrs. Vincent, or best of all, the Vincent's little boy, George, we later learned his name to be, why, then we boasted of it at the supper table, as one might say today, I saw President Roosevelt, Mrs. Roosevelt, Sisty, Buzzy. 
dr vincent kept the place on its toes not only by the steady improvement of its platform its amusements in the quality of the people who came to teach and preach but by the steady flow of new undertakings he planned incessantly to stir not only our souls but our minds we came to expect new ideas at each successive session and were never disappointed if sometimes a little bewildered behind all these various undertakings was the steadying hand of lewis miller the silent partner who had begun by spying out the land establishing a community laying the foundations for the institution as it exists today a centre of democratic christian culture dr vincent's masterpiece as i always thought came in eighteen seventy eight when he laid before his chautauquans a plan which had long been simmering in his never quiet mind he did this in the finest of what we call inspirational talks that i ever heard at least it stirred me so deeply that i have never forgotten the face of the orator nor more important the upturned faces of his hearers he announced a scheme for a four-year course of home reading under the direction of the chautauqua management adapted to men and women who had missed a college education but who felt a deep desire for knowledge and were willing to adopt any practical plan which would give them a college outlook it was to be called the chautauqua literary and scientific circle now this does not sound exciting but as a matter of fact it was deeply exciting for the speaker was pouring out his heart he had never had a college education he had never ceased to feel the lack of what he believed it would have given him he had struggled to make up for his loss by persistent systematic daily reading and study establishing the habit as a boy he had never abandoned it it had given him deep satisfaction supplied he thought the college outlook he believed there were thousands of men and women in the united states scores possibly hundreds in his audience who had been forced as he had been to sacrifice their early ambitions for education they had hidden the hunger in their hearts where at times it still gnawed he was offering them the same help he had found and confidently glowingly he outlined the course of home reading which dr john h finley has so aptly named the american adult education pioneer the uplifted faces all about me told the story particularly the faces of the women of thirty or more women of that generation had had their natural desire for knowledge intensified by the woman's rights movement in which the strongest plank had been a demand for the opportunity for higher education these women were now beyond the day when they could go to college but here was something which they saw intuitively was practical the immediacy of their response was in a degree accounted for by their devotion to dr vincent i suppose most of the women who frequented chautauqua were more or less in love with him the worship a man of overflowing sentiment receives from the benches but most of his audience would have preferred to die rather than reveal their secret passion well it was a great emotional experience with large and immediate practical results for before the summer session was over eight thousand people had joined the chautauqua literary and scientific circle they had joined and they were buying the books chosen the most important volume in that first year's course was green's short history of the english people in my judgment the most important book save one that the chautauqua literary and scientific circle ever included that exception being w c brownell's french traits the sudden demand for so large and expensive a volume as green's history outside of regular trade channels followed as it was by the spectacular sales of other books from which neither publisher nor writer had expected anything out of the normal set the whole publishing world agog and naturally raised the question how are we to get in on this new market there were many approaches all legitimate enough so far as i know i found a rather amusing proof of one not long ago in marjorie wiggin prescott's fine collection of manuscripts and rare books a volume of lew wallace's ben hur enriched by a letter to the publisher signed by mrs wallace and dated november twenty fourth eighteen eighty four 
the letter which is self-explanatory is reproduced here with mrs prescott's permission crawfordsville november twenty fourth eighteen eighty four dear sir because of inquiries of correspondence as to the number of wives general wallace has had i have thought best to instruct you to add to the dedication of ben hur making it to the wife of my youth who still abides with me this with general wallace's consent several literary clubs have made it a handbook for study in connection with roman history if by some means you could have it adopted by the chautauqua club which numbers twenty thousand members it might be worth while to try pardon the suggestion may i ask you to furnish me a report of the sales of ben hur year by year from the beginning with high regard very truly yours susan e wallace as the chautauqua literary and scientific circle grew there came increasing necessity of a steady sympathetic administration to help in this task it was decided in eighteen eighty to establish a monthly organ the chautauquan it was to be called in which portions of the required readings could be published more cheaply than in book form and through which by counsel and suggestions the leaders could keep in closer touch with the readers better meet their needs dr vincent was quick to sense the weak places in the organization and ingenious in devising ways to take care of them it was to try out one of his devices that dr flood was now asking my temporary help here was the situation that had been uncovered hundreds of those who had joined the great circle and bought its books were without dictionaries encyclopedias explanatory helps of any kind and they lived too far away on the plains in the mountains on distant farms to reach libraries headquarters were inundated with questions how do you pronounce this word translate this phrase who was this man this woman what does this or that mean could not the chautauquan take care of this difficulty suggested dr vincent by annotating the portions of the various texts to be read in that particular month let someone try it out as i happened to be the someone within reach when dr flood received the suggestion the attempt was put up to me temporary trial i was made to understand now i had known from childhood homes and towns where there were practically no books beyond the bible and children's spellers as books had always come after bread in our household i naturally pitied those who did not have them so i undertook the notes with the determination to make them as helpful as i could to my surprise and delight dr vincent sent word to me that i had caught his idea and that he had advised dr flood to ask me to prepare similar notes each month will you do it asked dr flood i jumped at the chance calculating that it would not take over two weeks of my month give me pin money and leave time for the microscope that my future was in it i did not dream but my task required better equipped libraries than titusville offered meadville only thirty miles away headquarters for the chautauquan had them and so i arranged to do my work there remaining until i had read the proofs an exacting job which never ceased to worry me what if the accent was in the wrong place what if i brought somebody into the world in the wrong year something of the kind happened occasionally and when it did i quickly discovered that while there might be many chautauqua readers who did not have books of reference there were more that did and knew how to use them once in touch with the office of the chautauquan i began to see things to do dr flood had little interest in detail the magazine was made up in a casual and to my mind a disorderly fashion i could not keep my fingers off a woman is a natural executive that has been her business through the ages intuitively she picks up sets to rights establishes order i began at once to exercise my inheritance proved useful was offered a full-time job and threw myself heartily into an attempt to learn how to make up a magazine in the way i suspected a magazine should be made up when the long-suffering foreman of the printing office discovered i was in earnest he undertook my education taught me the vocabulary the only galley i had heard of up to that time was a war vessel of the middle ages 
suggested dummies, and offered a model. He installed a proper respect for the dates on which copy was to be in, and forms closed, showed me the importance of clean copy by compelling me to see with my own eyes the time it took to make a correction, trained me until I could stand over the closing of the last form and direct the necessary changes to be made in order to make room for a three-line advertisement which had just arrived, and which, such as the need of the Chautauquan for advertising, must under no consideration be thrown out. When I could do that nonchalantly, I felt as if I had arrived. And this training I owed to as fine a craftsman as there was in the trade at that time. As well, he was a courteous and patient gentleman. Adrian McCoy, long the head of the press room where the Chautauquan was printed. My willingness to take on loose ends soon brought to my desk much of the routine office correspondence, letters to be answered by a more or less set form, signed with Dr. Flood's name, and mailed without troubling him to read them. In this grist were many letters from readers, women chiefly, who laid their troubles and hopes upon our shoulders, confident of understanding and counsel. Dr. Flood's answers to such communications were courteous but formal. Probably he appreciated, as I did not, that there lay safety. I felt strongly that such an appeal or confidence should have a personal, sympathetic letter, and I began producing them, pouring out counsel and pity. I shudder now to think of the ignorant sentiment I probably spilled. But my career as a professional counsellor was checked, suddenly, by the unexpected result of a series of letters to a contributor. This gentleman, a foreign lecturer and teacher, had been chilled by the lack of understanding by Americans of his ideals. And all of this he was expressing in letters to the office after our acceptance of one or two of his articles. I was deeply touched by his outpourings, and answered in kind of course signing my editor's name. Then one day Dr. Flood received a letter saying that on such a day the gentleman would be in Meadville. He must see the one who so understood him, and come he did. Poor Dr. Flood did not know what it was all about. But these letters, the visitor exclaimed. Oh, Dr. Flood said, Miss Tarbell wrote those. We'll speak to her. And so he was presented, letters in hand, Dr. Flood looking sternly at me and leaving me to my fate. Did you write these letters? The bewildered and disappointed stranger asked. All I could say was, yes, I wrote them. And Dr. Flood never saw them? No, I said, he never does. I might have known it was a woman, he groaned, and fled. And that was the last we ever saw or heard of him but it made a vast difference in my editorial correspondence. I was not satisfied, however, with setting things to rights and counseling the unhappy. Having convinced my editor-in-chief that I could keep his house in better order than he had been interested in doing, I became ambitious to contribute to its furnishing, to extend its field beyond matters purely Chautauquan. I began by offering contributions to what was called the editor's table, the editor's notebook. I began to write articles, even went off on trips to gather information on subjects which seemed to me to be fitting. The first and most ambitious of these undertakings was an investigation made in the patent office in Washington of the amount of inventing the record showed women to have done. I had been disturbed for some time by what seemed to me the calculated belittling of the past achievements of women by many active in the campaign for suffrage. They agreed with their opponents that women had shown little or no creative power. That, they argued, was because man had purposely and jealously excluded her from his field of action. The argument was intended, of course, to arouse women's indignation stir them to action. It seemed to me, rather, to throw doubt on her creative capacity. Power to create breaks all barriers. Women had demonstrated this, I believed, again and again, while carrying on what I, as an observer of society, was coming to regard as the most delicate, complex, and essential of all creative tasks, the making of a home. 
there was the field of invention at the moment it was being said in print and on the platform that in all the history of the patent office women had taken out only some three hundred patents i had seen so much of woman's ingenuity on the farm and in the kitchen that i questioned the figures and so i went to see feeling very important if scared at my rashness in daring to penetrate a government department and interview its head i was able to put my finger at once on over two thousand patents enough to convince me that man-made world or not if a woman had a good idea and the gumption to seek a patent she had the same chance as a man to get one this was confirmed by correspondence with two or three women who at the time were taking out patents regularly these dashes into journalism timid and factual as were the results gave my position more and more body began slowly to arouse my rudimentary capacity for self-expression at the same time my position was enriched by a novel feature of our undertaking one that any editor of a monthly journal can appreciate we published but ten issues suspending in july and august in order to get out on the grounds at chautauqua an eight-page newspaper the chautauqua assembly daily herald this meant moving our meadville staff bodily to the lake late in june i was soon contributing two columns of editorials a day to the herald comments on the daily doings of the assembly and making many stimulating acquaintances in doing it among them i valued particularly dr herbert b adams and dr richard t eli of johns hopkins university men who were stirring youth and shocking the elders by liberal interpretations of history and economics we felt rather proud of ourselves at chautauqua that we were liberal enough to engage dr adams and dr eli as regular lecturers and teachers and that our constituency accepted them if with occasional misgivings it was not only the faculty of johns hopkins which was adding to my friends one who remains to-day among those i most value came from its student body dr john h finley dr finley gave several summers to the assembly herald reading its copy and its proofs among other things it was he who read my two columns and no doubt kept me out of much trouble but once there did slip by him a misquotation over which he still chuckles when we talk of chautauqua days i made it a practice to head my first column with a digest of the day's happenings a line to an event and as a starter for the paragraph a quotation i had been rather pleased one day to select a line from james thompson the meek-eyed morn appears mother of dews a copy of the paper was always thrown on the veranda of my upstairs room around five o'clock in the morning and i hopped out of bed to see what had happened to my column that morning something dire had happened for my quotation ran the weak-eyed worm appears mother of dews eminence came from across the water annually and gave color and importance so we thought to our doings a foreign visitor with whom i had a pleasant acquaintance running over some years was dr j p mahaffey of the university of dublin Dr. Mahaffey had contributed a series of delightful articles to the required readings in the Chautauquan, Gossip About Greece, and in the summer of 1889 he came over for two or three courses of lectures at the assembly. A distinguished figure he was, and such a contrast in his tweeds, his free movements, his spirited, wide-ranging talk to most of us my acquaintance grew out of our mutual interest in the flora of any spot where we happened to be one day as i came in from a botanizing expedition outside the grounds carrying stocks of the lovely field lilies common in the region dr mahaffey seized my arm you care for flowers and plants i thought american women had no interest in them a libel i quickly hooted in defense of my sisterhood, I went diligently to work to show him our summer flora. But he cared for nothing as much as our summer lilies, begging me, after the flowering was over, to send him bulbs, which I proudly did. 
in exchange i received from his dublin garden seeds of a white poppy which he wrote me he had originally gathered in the shadow of the statue of memnon in egypt those poppies have always gone with me they flourished in my mother's garden in titusville now they flourish in my connecticut garden my life was busy varied unfolding pleasantly in many ways but it also after six years was increasingly unsatisfactory so unsatisfactory that i was secretly very secretly meditating a change i was scared by what the chautauquan seemed to be doing to the plan i had worked out for the development of my mind i had grown up with a stout determination to follow one course of study to the end to develop a specialty the work i was doing demanded a scattering of mind which i began to fear would unfit me for ever thinking anything through i realized that an editor of value must have made up his mind about more things than had i feel himself ready to fight for those things if necessary i had no program in which the chautauquan was interested moreover i did not want to be an editor but to break with the chautauquan meant sacrificing security i had always had a vision of myself settled somewhere in a secure corner simple not too large i never had wanted things i always had a dislike of impedimenta but i wanted something cheerful and warm and enduring there i could work over what interested me day in and day out with no alarm for my keep now the chautauquan was a secure berth so far as i could figure it would last through my time at least to give it up meant complete economic insecurity i probably should not have been willing to sacrifice what i think i had honestly earned if there had not been growing upon me a conviction of the sterility of security all about me were people who at least believed themselves materially secure they lived comfortably within their means they were busy keeping things as they were preserving what they had they were the most respectable people in town but secretly i was beginning to suspect their respectability one day listening to a fine elderly scotch presbyterian minister who had in his congregation a large group of these stable secure best citizens i was startled when he leaned over his pulpit and shaking his fist at us shouted you're dying of respectability was that what was happening to me i saw with increasing clearness that i could not go beyond a certain point on the chautauquan mentally socially spiritually if i remained it was to accept a variety of limitations and my whole nature was against the acceptance of limitations it was contrary to the nature of things as i saw them to be happy i must go on with fresh attempts fresh adventuring the thing that frightened me earlier in my youth came to the top now the thing that made me determine i would never marry because it meant giving up freedom was a trap it was clear enough that i was trapped comfortably most pleasantly most securely but trapped as time went on i realized that this security to which people so clung could not always be counted on they might think so but had i not seen beautiful homes sold under the hammer in titusville homes of those whom the town had looked on as impregnable financially in my years on the chautauquan in meadville i had been a shocked observer of one of the many dramatic political failures of the eighties the defeat of the republican candidate for governor of pennsylvania at a critical moment a meadville banker wallace delamater i was too much of a mugwump to sympathize with the republican platform but i liked wallace delamater i believed him as i think the records show to be a tool of a past master of machine politics matthew key taken up by key the resources of the delamater bank and of allied banks in meadville at the call of his party he made a campaign which was called brilliant there was no doubt of the result in meadville i went to bed early the night of the election expecting to be aroused by the ringing of bells the blowing of whistles for there was to be a celebration when i awakened with a start it was broad daylight had i slept through the celebration a sense of doom hung over me i dressed hurriedly went down to get the paper 
Wallace Delamater was defeated. Promptly, the Delamater Bank closed, and, one after another, four banks of the town followed. There was a heavy run on the one remaining, the one where I had my little deposit. The panic in the town was desperate. Everything was going. I don't think I have ever been more ashamed of anything in my life connected with money than I was when I took my bank book and went to my bank to ask for my deposit. It was all the money I had in the world. Times were bad. But I have always continued to be a little ashamed that I yielded to the panic, the more because my bank didn't fail. No, the security men flattered themselves they had achieved was never certain. Moreover, my security was costing more in certain precious things than I was willing to pay. Take the matter of making something professionally sound, useful, justifiable out of myself, which is the only one of these precious things that I am talking about. I could do no more towards it where I was. To begin with, I at last knew what I wanted to do. It was no longer to seek truth with a microscope. My early absorption in rocks and plants had veered to as intense an interest in human beings. I was feeling the same passion to understand men and women, the same eagerness to collect and to classify information about them. I find the proofs of this slow and unconscious change of allegiance in an accumulation of tattered notebooks tucked away for years, forgotten, and only brought out after I had set myself this curious task of tracing the road I have traveled through my eighty years, trying to find out why I did this thing and not that, getting acquainted with my own working life. I seem to have begun to enter observations on human beings soon after I settled down to learn how to put a magazine together in an orderly fashion. I applied the same method that I had used for so many years in collecting and classifying natural objects which excited my curiosity. Take leaves, on which I was always keen. I started out in high school to collect them from all the flora in my territory, classifying them by shapes, veins, stalks, color. Rarely do I take up a family book of those early years that there do not fall out from between the pages leaves of one thing or another that I had pressed to help me carry on my scheme of classification. I suspect that I did not get much beyond a glib naming of parts. Something analogous happened when I recognized that men and women were as well worth notes as leaves, that there was a science of society as well as of botany. What had happened was undoubtedly that the tumults, the challenges of my day, had finally penetrated my aloofness, and that I was feeling more and more the need of taking a part in them. The decade I spent in Poland and in the Chautauquan had a background not so unlike that of the present decade. At its beginning, we were only fifteen years from a civil war which had left behind not only a vast, devastated region with the problem of its reconstruction, but the problem of a newly freed people. It had left bitterness which, in its intensity and endurance, no war but a civil war ever leaves. We had had our inflation, a devastating boom followed by seven years of depression, outbreaks of all the various forms of radical philosophy the world then knew. Youth talks glibly of communism today as if it had just appeared in the country, but Marxian communists transferred the headquarters of the International to New York City in the 70s. More conspicuous than the communists were the anarchists. Every city in the United States had its little group, preaching and every now and then practicing direct action. Indeed, they were a factor in all the violent labor disturbances of the period. In 1879, prosperity had come back with a whoop, and, as she usually does after a long absence, had quickly exhausted herself by fantastic economic excesses. By the time I undertook to annotate the Chautauqua Literary and Scientific Circle's readings, the country had begun to suffer again from its wanton speculation and reckless overbuilding of railroads. Factories and mines and mills shut down, and when work stopped, disorder began, particularly on the railroads of the Southwest, the awful massacre of Chinese in Wyoming, 
more awful the haymarket riot in chicago followed as it was by the execution of four men all counsellors of violence to be sure but no one of them found guilty either of making or of throwing the bomb the eighties dripped with blood and men struggled to get at causes to find corrections to humanize and socialize the country for then as now there were those who dreamed of a good world although at times it seemed to them to be going mad the chautauquan interested itself in all of this turbulent and confused life indeed it rapidly became my particular editorial concern we noted and discussed practically every item of the social program which has been so steadily developing in the last fifty years the items which have crystallized into the square deal the new freedom the new deal the present argument for high wages we made in the eighties we called it the new economic coefficient in our industrial life it is the well-paid workman said the chautauquan who is a relatively large consumer we are built upon a foundation of which this well-paid workman is an important part as for hours and conditions we were ardent supporters of the eight-hour day organized labor's chief aim in the eighties and we were for contracts between labor and capital each being held responsible for his side of the bargain we were for education arbitration legislation the program of the knights of labor rather than the program of force which the growing american federation of labor was adopting we discussed interminably the growing problem of the slums were particularly strong for cooperative housing laundries and bake shops we supported the popular town and country club seeking to keep a healthy balance between the two we were advocates of temperance but shied at prohibition largely i think because it had become a political issue and we did not like to see our idealists going into politics as bellamy and henry george and the leaders of many causes were doing that is in the decade of the eighties we were discussing and thinking about the same fundamentals that we are today my realization of the stress of the period began at home titusville and all the oil region of pennsylvania were struggling to loosen the hold of the mighty monopoly which since its first attack on the business in eighteen seventy two had grown in power and extent until it owned and controlled over ninety per cent of the oil industry outside of the production of the raw crude the region was divided into two hostile camps the independent producers and refiners and the standard oil company their maneuvers and strategy kept town and country in a constant state of excitement of suspicion of hope and of despair there was a steady weakening of independent ranks both by the men worn out or ruined by the struggle and those who saw peace and security for themselves only in settling and gave up the fight in those days i looked with more contempt on the man who had gone over to the standard than on the one who had been in jail i felt pity for the latter man but none for the deserters from the ranks of the fighting independence those were the days when the freeing of transportation the privilege which had more to do with the making of the monopoly than anything else more even than the great ability of its management was the aim of all reformers for years the independents had worked for an interstate commerce law which would make rate discrimination a crime to me such a law had come to have a kind of sanctity it was the new freedom and when it was passed in eighteen eighty seven i felt an uplift such as nothing in public life unless i accept mr cleveland's tariff message of the year before had ever given me but it was not the economic feature of the struggle in the oil region which deeply disturbed or interested me it was what it was doing to the people themselves to the people i knew to my father and mother and their friends it was the divided town the suspicion and greed and bitterness and defeats and surrenders here was a product meant to be a blessing to men so i believed and it was proving to be a curse to the very ones who had discovered it developed it i began to fill pages with notes of things seen and heard and finally i decided i should write a novel about it 
Very secretly indeed I went at it, assembling a cast, outlining a plot, writing two or three chapters. Poor stuff. Luckily I soon found out I was beyond my depth and gave it up. From my notebooks I judged that I abandoned my novel the more readily because I had conceived what I called a more fundamental research. This was nothing less than a science of society to be illustrated by my own observations on men and women. Looking it over now, I see that the framework came from reading the voluminous discussions of the nature of society, then flooding the public. I took my framework where I found it, but I filled it in with observations, gathered on all sides, of people I knew, heard about, particularly read about in the newspaper. But this ambitious work soon met the same fate as the novel. It broke off at the end of the third chapter, because I had concluded I could not construct society as it was until I knew more about woman. I suspected she had played a larger part in shaping society than she realized, or perhaps was willing to admit. I was questioning the argument that this is entirely a man-made world. I had found too many woman-made parts in it to accept the characterization at its face value. My science of society would not be honest, I concluded, if the only part woman was allowed to play in it was that of doormat, toy, and tool. I was troubled, too, by the argument that women must be given suffrage if society was to be improved. Man had made a mess of the world, I was told. Woman must take his tools and straighten things up. I did not feel the confidence of my courageous friends. Why should we expect them to do better with the vote than men have done, I asked. Because they are women, I was told. But they were human beings like men, and they were human beings with no experience of the tools they wanted to use. And I had enough sense of the past to believe that experience counted, and that it would be wise for all men and women to consult it when they tried new ventures. There had been women in public life in the past. What had they done? I had to satisfy myself before I went further with my science of society or joined the suffragists. It was humiliating not to be able to make up my mind quickly about the matter, as most of the women I knew did. What was the matter with me, I asked myself, that I could not be quickly sure? Why must I persist in the slow, tiresome practice of knowing more about things before I had an opinion. Suppose everybody did that. What chance for intuition, vision, emotion, action? My notebooks show that I began my plotting by making out a list of women who seemed to offer food for reflection. The group that excited me most were the women of the French Revolution. I made little studies of several, wrote little pieces about them, and these little pieces I submitted to the editor of the Chautauquan. He published several of them, a study of Madame de Stahl, of Marie Antoinette, of Madame Roland. But soon I became heartily ashamed of my sketches, written, as they were, from so meager an equipment. I felt this particularly about Madame Roland. I made up my mind that I was going to know more about this woman that she probably would teach me what sort of contribution might be expected from a woman in public life. That meant research. How was I to carry it on? Whatever studying I did depended on my ability to support myself while doing it. Whatever studying I did while on the Chautauquan must be turned into something available for the magazine. My time and strength belonged to it. Obviously, I could not do sufficient research and continue my position. It was as impossible as it had been to act as the preceptress of the Poland Union Seminary and at the same time carry on my study with the microscope. Where was I to carry on this research? There was but one place, Paris. And how was I to finance myself in Paris, a strange country and a strange tongue, long enough to write a book? I did not consider the possibility of getting a regular job. I did not want one. I wanted freedom, and I had an idea that there was no freedom in belonging to things, no freedom in security. It took time to convince myself that I dared go on my own, but finally I succeeded. Coming to a decision has a loosening tonic effect on a mind which has been floundering in uncertainty. 
liberated it rushes gaily hopefully to the charting of a new course i had no sooner resolved to strike out on my own than my mind was bubbling with plans i forgot that i was thirty-three years old and according to the code of my time and my society too old for new ventures i forgot that outside of my very limited experience on the chautauquan i knew nothing of the writing and publishing world had literally no acquaintance among editors i forgot that i was afraid of people believed them all so much greater and more important than they often turned out to be that it cost me nervous chills to venture with a request into a stranger's presence dismissing all these real handicaps i plunged gaily into planning for a career in journalism self-directed freelance journalism surely i could find subjects enough in paris to write about subjects that would interest american newspapers we were in the thick of a great agitation over the condition and the conduct of american cities the chautauquan had touched it occasionally how did paris keep house i planned a syndicate of my own which would answer all questions out of my newspaper work might not articles grow for magazines i thought so and books beginning of course with my study of madame roland so long as i told nobody about my plans they worked beautifully carried me upward and onward into a new and happier more profitable more satisfying world but when i announced my decision laid out what i proposed to do all the glow and confidence went out of me all the weaknesses in my venture came again to the top there were friends who said none too politely remember you are past thirty women don't make new places for themselves after thirty there were friends who resented my decision as a reflection on themselves a woman whose friendship i valued said bluntly you are one of us aren't we good enough for you my act was treason in her eyes the whole force of the respectable circles to which i belonged that respectable circle which knew as i did not the value of security won the slender chance of replacing it if lost or abandoned was against me and so out of friendliness when i told my editor-in-chief i was leaving going to paris to study he was shocked how will you support yourself he asked really anxious knowing that i must depend on my own efforts by writing i said you're not a writer he said you'll starve he had touched the weakest point in my venture i was not a writer and i knew it i knew i should never be one in the high sense which i then and still more now give to that word i had neither the endowment nor the passion nor the ambition to be a writer i was rather a student wanting to understand things quite regardless of how i could use that understanding if i reached it there was much selfishness in my wanting to know for the sake of knowing much of a dead scholar in me and that dead scholar has always hung more or less a weight about my neck but if i was not a writer i had certain qualifications for the practice of the modest kind of journalism on which i had decided i counted no little on my habit of planning in advance what i was going to do and i had a strong conviction that a plan of my own was worth more than any plan which was made for me again if i could not write i did have a certain sense of what mattered in a subject and a strong conviction that it was my sense of what mattered and not somebody else's that would give my work freshness and strength if it was to have any then there was my habit of steady painstaking work that ought to count for something and perhaps i could learn to write if i were to do so could i do better than soak myself in french prose i had read french steadily from my school days i had done not a little translating of articles from the big reviews for the chautauquan if i could live with the language might i not master something of what seemed to me its essential qualities those which gave it both body and charm these qualities were the soundness of structure the way it held together and the beautiful clarity of expression at least i could try for them but when i tried to explain all this to my critical friends they continued frankly skeptical indignant it was my father and mother who backed me up though i think they were both puzzled and fearful 
i don't know what you can do ida my father said that's for you but if you think you can do it try it but in the end it took all the grit i had to go ahead breaking up established relations is not easy you begin by pulling up deeply rooted things rooted in your heart you abandon once cherished purposes when i left the chautauquan i was no longer the eager and confident young woman who ten years before had started out for herself in poland ohio i was ten years older and i was keenly conscious that i had in those ten years accumulated a fairly complete collection of shattered idols that i could forget them as quickly and as completely as i did i owe to the paris of the nineties i had scarcely passed her gates before i had fallen under her spell at once i was experiencing all the amazing rejuvenation that comes from falling in love whatever the object it was not to be see paris and die as more than one friend had jeered i knew with certainty it was to be see paris and live end of chapter five Chapter Six, Part One of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. I fall in love. Falling in love with Paris at first sight, a coup de feu it was. In no way dimmed the energy and the care with which, on the day of my arrival, I began to put into operation the cautious and laborious plan for self-support I had brought along. It rather intensified it as i must begin at the bottom to build up contacts with strangers on the other side of the ocean and as there was but one hundred and fifty dollars in my pocket there was no time to waste in the ten years i had been trying to support myself i had learned that the art of spending money is quite as important in a sound financial program as the art of earning it i had been going on the theory as i still am practice is another story that what i earned must cover my expenses and leave a surplus for emergencies and expansion i had applied my principles to my small salary on the chautauquan never over one hundred dollars a month well enough to get myself to paris and have this little reserve to care for myself while i was proving or disproving that i could convince a few american editors whom i had never seen that my goods were worth buying the first step obviously in carrying out my program was cheap living luckily for me two of my associates on the chautauquan excited by my undertaking had decided to join me one josephine henderson was a friend of titusville days and like myself a graduate of allegheny college joe as we called her was a handsome woman with a humorous look on life healthy for me i have never had a friend who judged my balloons more shrewdly or pricked them so painlessly with us was a beautiful girl mary henry the daughter of one of the militant w c t u workers of that day a neighbor and a friend as well as a co-worker of the great temperance leader francis willard at the steamer a friend of mary's appeared announcing that she too was going along this meant four of us to share rent and food back in titusville i had picked on the latin quarter as at once the cheapest and the most practical place in paris for one to live who must go on the cheap then too the university was in the latin quarter and we were all planning to take lectures i was even flirting with the idea that i might find time to take a degree so on arrival putting our bags in the little room of the cheap hotel on the right bank to which we had gone we headed at once for the latin quarter i had picked on the neighborhood where i wanted to settle near the musee de cluny not that i knew a thing about the musee or what was in it simply cluny was one of the words that had always pulled me this magic was largely responsible for our settling in the rue de somerard almost next door to the spot in the city which save one was to have the greatest fascination as well as the deepest consolation for me but finding these quarters was no easy task my friends gulped as i did at the stuffiness the dinginess 
the primitive sanitation, the obvious fleas, and the suspicion of other unmentionable pests in the places at which we looked. But settle I would, and so, with groans, they consented finally to the taking of two tiny bedrooms, a salon, along with the use of a kitchenette, in one of the four apartments controlled by a Madame Bonnet. Our selection was not as unwise as it looked at the moment. Indeed, as it turned out, Madame Bonnet remained my landlady throughout the coming three years. As quickly as we had found our lodging, we established relations with the little shops in the neighborhood, where one could, for a few sous, buy all the makings of a meal. You bought exactly what you needed and no more. A single egg, one roll or croissant, a gill of milk, two cups apiece of café au lait, never having a drop left in the pot. Brought up as we had all been at loaded tables, the close calculation shocked us at first as something mean, stingy. Why, the very scraps from a meal at home would feed us here. And that was true. More shame to our bringing up. But we learned to buy as our thrifty neighbors did, and to like it. And we learned how to order at the cheap and orderly little restaurants of the quarter so as to get a sufficient meal of really excellent food for a franc then nineteen cents, or, as we carelessly reckoned it, twenty-one hundred centimes to a franc. Only on grand occasions did we allow ourselves two francs. The pleasantest and most profitable part of the experience was the acquaintances we made with the women who kept the little shops, the little restaurants. As soon as they were convinced of our financial responsibility and our social seriousness, they became friendly a friendliness not based on the few sous we were spending so carefully, but on interest and curiosity. We were new types to them. But once convinced we were what we pretended to be, they treated us with a deference quite different from the noisy greetings they gave the people of the neighborhood, or their rather contemptuous familiarity with the occasional cocotte who strayed in. That is, we were very soon placed by the shopkeepers of the vicinity. It was my first lesson in the skill, almost artistry, with which all classes of the French people classify those with whom they are thrown in contact, notably foreigners. Later I was to observe this in the more highly developed classes where I established professional relationship. I was a stranger seeking information, an American journalist, a student, so I told them. But what kind of person was I? What was there in me they could tie to, depend upon? Obviously I was not rich. If I had been, there would have been quickly gathered around me a group to offer entertainment, as well as treasures to buy. But it was clear I had little money, so that was out of the question. There are other things by which the French label you, a woman particularly. Charm, beauty, chic, l'esprit, seriousness, capacity to work, intelligence, bonté. Those with whom I had dealings for any length of time hit perfectly on my chief asset. I was a worker, a femme travailleuse, they said to one another, and if they passed me to an acquaintance, that was the recommendation. No people believe more than the French in the value and dignity in hard work. I was treated with respect because of my working quality. It was not saying that I should not have gone farther and faster if I had been a beauty, if I had had what they called charm and the fine secret of using it, but they were willing to take me for what I had. Being a worker, the chances were I was serious. I might or might not prove intelligent, but here they gave me the benefit of the doubt and waited for a final answer. That which they were slowest in making up their minds about was goodness, bonté. They were not willing to accept anything but natural, unconscious goodness, and it takes time to make sure about that. While we were finding our way about, I was at work. If I did not have the documents to prove it, I would not believe today that just a week after arriving, and in spite of the excitement and fatigue of settling, I had written and mailed two newspaper articles. Enamored as I was of the city, no work could have been more satisfying than that I had laid out for myself. 
my little self-directed syndicate concerned itself with the practical everyday life of the city one is always keen to know all the common things about the thing or person one loves how did paris keep herself so clean what did she eat and drink and where did she get it how much did it cost her where did she go for fun how did she manage it that even her very poor seemed to know how to amuse themselves that her beggars were a recognized institution there were a multitude of things i thirsted to know about her and if i could get my bread and butter in finding out what luck what luck at once i became an omnivorous reader of the newspapers and found to my joy that many of them felt as i did about the parisian scene they carried paragraphs as captivating as those that our new yorker unearths for its fascinating editorial department on the city to which it belongs another discovery which surprised me was that my best source for illustration was the illustrated catalogues of the french salons of recent years i wanted pictures of markets of rivers of beggars of marriages of all the things that people were doing as they went about their business and what rejoiced me was that many french artists seemed to love the streets and what went on there in much the same way that i did they loved to see paris at her daily toil meeting her daily problems and every year they turned out pictures showing her at it later i was to discover that this daily life of the parisians of different classes has always been material for able artists the best illustrations i found for my madame roland in her youth were those of chardin in the louvre my manner of living the contacts and circumstances attending the gathering of my material for my newspaper articles brought me for the first time in my life into daily relations with that greatest segment of every country's population those whom we call the poor and of whom if we are well to do or if we are rich we are so curiously unconscious i had belonged in all my conscious life to the well-to-do those who spent a dollar without seriously weighing it society had seemed to me to be chiefly made up of such people of course there were the rich but they were so few in number as to be negligible at least they had never counted in my life nor had the poor counted as a permanent class i had the american notion that the chief economic duty of the poor was to become well-to-do the laborer the clerk the man who worked for others should save his money put it into the business or start out for himself no matter how hard how meagre the return dignity and success lay in being your own master owning your own home i am sure my father would rather have grubbed cornmeal and bacon from a piece of stony land which was his own than have had all the luxuries on a salary one of his complaints against the great oil trust was that it was turning the men of the oil region into hired men mighty prosperous hired men some of them but nevertheless taking orders even orders as to what to say for whom to vote to his way of thinking this was a failure for an american i suspect his philosophy working in me was at least partially responsible for my revolt against the kind of security i had achieved on the chautauquan i was a hired girl but in the society where i found myself in paris there was no such contempt for the fixed job on the contrary it was something for which you were responsible to which you owed an obligation serious workers in paris seem to me to give to the job the same kind of loyalty that serious men and women in america gave to the businesses they owned you respected yourself and were respected in proportion to your fidelity to it you might be advanced but more probably not opportunity did not grow on every bush as at home and if it came a frenchman's way he waited at home you seized it trusting to luck here luck seemed to me to have little or no standing in a business enterprise big as it counted in the lotteries in which everybody took part to my surprise i found these people working so busily and constantly were not restless like the americans nor were they generally envious i had a feeling that my concierge who had never been across the seine to the right bank 
who lived in a room almost filled by her huge bed and its great feather puffs who must have looked long at a sou before she spent it would not have changed places with anybody in paris were not the lodgers on whom she kept so strict a watch kind generous and regular with fees had she not friends in the street might she not win a slice of fortune one day from the fraction of a lottery ticket which she annually found a way to buy and who had so magnificent a cat the pride of the house what more could she ask certainly there was more interest in the tasks less restlessness less envy than in the same class in america was it my father's philosophy which made the difference was it your duty if you were poor to struggle to be well-to-do and if well-to-do to struggle to be rich it meant you were always trying to be somebody else if it was your duty to be discontented could you escape envy was it not necessary if you were to keep yourself up to the effort to feed yourself on envy as in war men must be fed on hate if they are to kill with vigor and gusto it was too much to believe that the content the fidelity to the job were universal nevertheless it was sufficient to cement the laborious poor into a powerful and recognized class a class with traditions customs recognized relations to other classes having its own manner of homes amusements worship a class self-respecting jealous of its prerogatives and able in need to protect itself but the multitude of hard-working and fairly satisfied men and women were not all the poor with whom i came close there were those who could find no work there were many of them for the long world depression of the nineties was on its way the winter of ninety one and ninety two was a cruel one and the museums libraries lecture rooms churches where i went about my daily duties were swarmed with poor souls trying to deceive the guardians into thinking that they had come to study pictures read books listen to lectures to confess their sins or listen to mass the guardians only saw them when they became a crowd or attempted to camp for the day most pathetic to me were their efforts to make furtive toilets taking a comb from a pocket to smooth tangled hair scissors to cut the fringe from a frayed cuff there were soup kitchens to keep them from starving though many a one starved or froze or ended his misery in the seine that winter at one of these kitchens i officiated for a brief time it was run by the mccall mission in the faubourg st antoine i was not there as a samaritan but as a reporter looking for copy what could i do for them but tell americans what a few americans were doing in paris to ease the vast misery it might bring a few sous for soup i believe it did but they pulled less strongly on my sympathy than a class of the poor which i found to be in our quarter men and women no longer young past the employing age who lived alone on tiny incomes sometimes the fruit of their own past thrift sometimes an inheritance again the gift of a friend i watched and speculated about how they did it the more seriously because i asked myself if the day might be coming when i should belong to this class if i ever did i hoped i could carry it off with as much dignity as the one called the countess on our street she lived sous les toits in a high house opposite me a tall erect white-haired woman in a gown and cape of faded and patched silk which still showed its quality as did its wearer more than once i watched her stop late at night at the garbage can on the sidewalk opposite turning over its contents many of the tradespeople seemed to feel that she honored them when she came in to buy an occasional egg or apple she was so gracious so completely grand dame one day i heard the woman from whom i bought my cafe au lait say will not madame honor me by trying my coffee it is still hot she was pouring out a cup as she said it and the countess with a benignant smile said if that will give you pleasure my good marie she needed it marie knew that but marie was more than paid by that smile it is a great honor she told me lest being a foreigner i did not understand the countess to have so great a lady come into one's shop 
there it was again another standard than money the standard of class breeding cultivation the grand manner the more i saw of the gallant poor of paris the more convinced i was if they could get on so could i learning to live on what i could make and i was going to make something my doubt about that was set at rest some six weeks after my arrival when i received a check for my first syndicate article five dollars it was quickly followed by checks from two more of the six papers to which i had submitted my syndicate proposition fifty per cent was not a bad percentage and they were good papers the pittsburgh dispatch the cincinnati times star and the chicago tribune these three papers remained faithful to me until the election of eighteen ninety two compelled them to give all their space to politics so they explained i believed them for they had all written me kind letters about my stuff and the time star unsolicited raised my pay to seven dollars fifty cents then the unbelievable happened in december a little less than three months after my arrival in paris scribner's magazine accepted a story a grand christmas present indeed that news fiction was not in the plan but one of the first pieces of work i did after arriving in paris was a story born of a delightful relationship with an old french dyer of titusville monsieur claude as soon as i had finally determined that i would burn all bridges and go to paris for study i had set about my preparation in thorough fashion there was the language i had read it fluently for years but speak it no could i master enough in the few months i had before sailing to find my way about if so i must have someone to talk with the best the town afforded was monsieur claude and his mouse-like wife they were flattered by my request three times a week i went and we talked and studied until they both were sure i could make myself understood in common matters in this delightful association i discovered that the passion of monsieur claude the longing of his heart was to see france before he died he had insisted that i learn and almost daily repeat beranger's france adorée once in paris i understood him wrote his story sent it a trial balloon to scribner's magazine the selection was made on a principle which young writers too rarely consider when they attempt to place their wares and that is an understanding of the tastes and prejudices and hobbies of periodicals useless in eighteen ninety to send a story on france adore to a magazine which was interested purely and simply in realistic literature but the inexperienced writer frequently does not realize that naturally i had learned in my work on the chautauquan something of the pet interests of the leading publishing houses i knew that scribners enjoyed french cultivation french character french history i hoped my sentimental title france adore would not antagonize the editor of scribners magazine but i had expected nothing from it being in that state of mind where i had ceased to expect only to accept so that when i received a friendly letter from mr burlingame the editor of the magazine saying that he liked the story that he accepted it i felt as one must who suddenly draws a fortune in the sweepstakes in due time a check for one hundred dollars arrived what excitement in our little salon when i showed my companions that check now declared our beautiful mary we can move to the champs elysees and she would have done it for she was one of those who always see spring in a single sparrow we stayed where we were i requiring a whole flock of sparrows to convince me that it was spring the influence of the story on my fortunes was all out of proportion to its value most important was the courage it gave me if i a stranger could do something that a great editor of a great magazine thought good enough to accept why after all i might work it out that which moved me most deeply gave me joy that made me weep was that now i should have something to show to my family i had felt a deserter times were hard in the titusville household in these early nineties my father's and brother's experiences in the oil business of which i want to speak later were more than discouraging they were alarming my sister was ill and in the hospital my mother's letters were saturated with anxiety 
and here was I, the eldest child in the family, a woman of years and of some experience, who had been given an education, whose social philosophy demanded that she do her part in working out family problems. Here was I across the ocean, writing picayune pieces at a fourth of a cent a word, while they struggled there. I felt guilty, and the only way I had kept myself up to what I had undertaken was the hope that I could eventually make a substantial return. If any one of the family felt that I should have been at home, there was never a hint of it. From them I had unwavering sympathy and encouragement. But if in three months' time I could do what I had done, and I made the most of it in my letters home, why, then they would see some hope for the future. Not only would the story help them to believe in me, it would give something more imposing to show to inquiring friends than the newspaper articles which had been their only exhibit. When the story appeared in the following spring, the reverberations in my Paris circle were encouraging and useful. I even heard of it from the other side, as we called the right bank, for Theodore Stanton, at that time the head of the Associated Press in Paris, came with Mrs. Stanton to call on me and tell me he liked the story. The most important fruit was that Mr. Burlingame looked me up when he made his annual spring visit to Europe. Here was my chance to tell him about Madame Roland, to ask if he thought his house would be interested in such a biography, if it turned out to be a good piece of work. The suggestion would have to be considered in New York, he replied, but he promised me it would be considered. And it was, for not long afterwards he wrote me that the house was interested in my project, certainly wanted to see the manuscript. This was enough to settle finally a struggle that had tormented me for many weeks. I had come to Paris, determined to fit myself for magazine work along historical and biographical lines. But once close to the world of the scholar, surrounded by men and a few women who lived stern, self-denying lives in order to master a field however small, I was seized with an ambition to be a scholar. It was a throwback to my old passion for the microscope. I would specialize in the French Revolution. I would become a professor. But Mr. Burlingame's answer to my inquiry as to whether the Scribner Company would be friendly to a biographical study of my lady settled the matter, which shows, I take it, how shallow my scholarly ambitions really were. The Scribner connection was not the only one putting heart into me. Among my early trial balloons was one marked for McClure's Syndicate, New York City. It carried an article of 2,000 words with a catchy title, The King of Paris, cribbed from a French newspaper. It was the story of Jean Alphand and his services to the city. The balloon reached its destination. The article was promptly accepted, with a promise of $10 when it was published, also a suggestion that they would be glad to consider other subjects if I had them to offer which I did. Indeed, I gave them no time to forget me. Not that they took all I hustled across the Atlantic, but they took enough to make me feel that this might be a stable and prosperous market for short and timely articles. When suggestions finally began to come from them, I felt the ground firmer on my feet. One of these suggestions led me into an especially attractive new field, and in the long run had an important bearing on my major interest, Madame Roland. It was that I try a series of sketches of French women writers. There was a respectable group of them, and I asked nothing better than to look them up. I began with a woman who at that time was introducing leading contemporary English and American writers to the French through the Revue de Du Monde, Madame Blanc, her pen name Theodore Benson, a person of rare distinction and of gallant soul. She had been a lady-in-waiting at Napoleon III's court, had made an unfortunate marriage, was now living on a small income and what she could earn by writing. In her salon there was a portrait taken in her young womanhood which charmed me, but when I spoke of it she shook her head as if she did not want to remember it. Un femme qui n'existe plus, she said. Hard worker as Madame Blanc was, she found time to start me on my rounds among the French women writers. 
i doubt if there was an american writer of our day who would have had both the kindness of heart and the sureness of herself to take so much trouble for an unknown woman she started me off and i turned out ten or a dozen little pieces before i was through with one of my subjects i had an amusing flirtation i think i may call it a flirtation this was madame de la foy who with her husband had done eminent work in archaeology and who had a room full of exhibits in the louvre to her credit a very great person indeed madame de la foy was the only woman i had ever seen at that time who wore men's clothes it had been found necessary to put her into trousers for excavating work and she liked them so well and m de la foy loved her so in them that they obtained permission from the french government for her to wear them in paris from more than one source i heard of the sensation she created among servants when she came to call they abandoned their duties to peep from dark places at the woman in men's clothes madame de la foy and i grew friendly over the history of the exploits of women in the world and it took no time at all for me to decide to write the history of women from eve up as if i had not already enough on my hands she applauded my idea gave me many suggestions but it never went any further than my few visits which as i say were more or less flirtations she was such a pretty little man so immaculate the best tailors in paris did her i was told that i could not keep admiring eyes off her she used her eyes too and loved to pat me on the knee partly i suppose because i always blushed when she did it it was an amusing acquaintance and a profitable one to me for she was as interested in my plans for articles as if i had been one of her own another woman who interested me greatly was judith gautier my interest was stirred by my indignation that her name had been left off the list of living women distinguished in french literature sent to the chicago exposition of eighteen ninety three there was much speculation among my friends as to how it happened my own conclusion was that it was because of her long and impassioned devotion to the music of richard wagner the first wagner opera to be given in paris was tannhauser this was in the early sixties when judith gautier was about fourteen years old she went to the opera with her father theophile gautier and was enthusiastic although the house received it coldly as they were walking home a little fellow with hollow cheeks eagle nose and very bright eyes joined them he rejoiced with cheerful violence over the failure of the opera the girl angered forgot her manners and blurted out it is clear sir that you know you have heard a masterpiece and that you are talking of a rival do you know who that was saucebox her delighted father asked as they passed on no who hector berlioz it was the beginning of a lifelong devotion wagner was to her not only the master musician but a species of divinity in eighteen eighty two she published a volume on him valuable for its reminiscences early in the winter of eighteen ninety two lohengrin was announced for the season of grand opera i was amazed at the loud and bitter protests among the few lovers of wagner who had courage to come to the defence of the master was judith gautier she was abused for it as this was my first realization that political hatred ever influences the judgment in matters of art i took the incident very much to heart i could understand why people might dislike wagnerian music but that the soldier should be called out to protect the opera house when one of his greatest works was to be given shocked me you could then so hate an enemy that beauty herself was outraged it was easy for me to conclude that judith gautier's name had been left off the list of writing women sent to the chicago exposition because the committee wanted to punish her for defending the works of a great artist in whom she profoundly believed the opening up of opportunities so much more quickly than i had dared dream spurred me to longer and harder hours at work there were few mornings that i was not at my desk at eight o'clock there were few nights that i went to bed before midnight and there was real drudgery in making legible copy after my article was written it was all done by longhand 
careful and painstaking handwriting it was i was to find later that mr mcclure's partner in the syndicate mr j s phillips trying to estimate the possibilities in this correspondent bombarding them with articles and suggestions set me down from my handwriting as a middle-aged new england schoolteacher but if life was hard and life was meagre and if down at the bottom of my heart it was continuously in question to which class of the poor i would finally belong life to my surprise was taking on a varied pattern very different from the drab existence of hard work and self-denial that i had planned and was prepared to endure to the end it began at the rue de somerard where at the outset we stumbled on what turned out to be the most colorful unusual and frequently perplexing association that had ever come the way of any one of us when we took our rooms from madame bonnet she had told us that one room in the apartment was reserved for an egyptian prince who came only for the weekends he was bien comme il faut très riche très everything desirable he would not disturb us we might never see him upon inquiry we discovered that all madame bonnet's rooms save those we were taking were occupied by egyptian students of law or medicine or diplomacy the prince himself a cousin of the khedive was in the military school at st cyr he kept a room at madame bonnet's to spend an occasional holiday or sunday with his compatriots all of his age and all of the upper classes we all shared the american flutter over titles and when we caught a first glimpse of the prince and his friends we were still more excited they were quite the most elegant-looking male specimens so far as manners and clothes went that any one of us had ever seen here was more in the way of flavor than we had bargained for we had come to study the french and had dropped into an egyptian colony we soon discovered that they were as curious about us as we were about them for hardly were we settled when madame bonnet came to say that the messieurs were all in her salon wouldn't we come in and make their acquaintance of course we went they wanted us to dance now it was sunday and we had all been brought up under the methodist discipline sunday was a day of rest and worship and no play no amusement of any kind in my household at least i was supposed to play only hymns on the piano as we were supposed to read only religious books my mother and i compromised at last on gottschalk's last hope she being moved by the story of its composition thought that it must be religious but martha and poet and peasant my two other showpieces were forbidden indeed when i was forty years old my father catching me reading a volume of a certain congressional trust investigation on a sunday afternoon reproved me in his gentle way you shouldn't read that on sunday ida i quickly exchanged it for pilgrim's progress which is not without suggestion for a student of the trust my young companions were particularly shocked at the egyptian's invitation to dance i think it had never occurred to them that all people did not keep sunday no we said a little severely we don't dance on sunday i had the satisfaction of hearing them whisper soberly to one another très religieuse it was just as well i thought that they should have that idea to start with better than starting with the degree of intimacy they might see in our dancing in their landlady's salon on a first meeting but we had what was for us an exciting evening and when we left and they all begged come again we promised that we would end of chapter six part one Chapter Six, Part Two of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. I Fall in Love, Part Two. It was the beginning of a weekly party. Madame Bonnet gave the Egyptians their dinners. We agreed to take dinners once a week with her. We couldn't afford more, and besides, we wanted to be on the safe side in our relations. There must be no question in their minds about our entire respectability respectability as we understood it 
what interested me particularly was that at once they wanted to understand our conventions social and religious and political nothing disturbed them more i found than a feeling that perhaps they had not quite understood that unintentionally they had infringed on our customs once convinced of this we could go with entire freedom to our weekly egyptian evenings as i recall them they were happy evenings much like children's parties at home for the egyptians loved games tricks charades play of any sort they laughed and shouted and if something went wrong flew into a rage like children the meat of the connection was the talk which sometimes ran far into the night all of these young men were training for some kind of professional or official position two or three of them had taken from three to four years at german gymnasia or english universities all of them spoke three or four languages the prince's english was perfect and no one of us could ever hope to approach the french of the group learned for the most part in switzerland as children they had much more curiosity and real information about the social customs of other countries than we had they were eager to know all about our ways particularly the life of women their relation to men before and after marriage there were would-be reformers of egyptian marriage customs among them especially did they resent the convention which prevented them looking at the face of the bride before the marriage ceremony one of the group had made a vow never to marry as long as that custom existed and was urging his compatriots to join him nearly all of them insisted that they would never marry more than one woman they asked with a frankness startling to our ears about the way monogamy worked in the united states they were curious to know the position of the mistress and when we were shocked and insisted that a good man never had a mistress they were frankly incredulous it would never work out they insisted one wife they understood but one wife and no mistress seemed entirely impractical politics interested them profoundly particularly did they hate england how deeply and bitterly i did not realize until in january of ninety two news of the death of the khedive tufik pasha son of ismail pasha great-grandson of mohammed ali came to the rue de somerard madame bonnet came in at once to tell us how sorrowful our friends were and to ask that we dine with them that night we found them very grave he was a good man they insisted our friend what was going to happen now i took it they feared changes in government which might make their own futures uncertain they were uneasy frightened and wanted us to understand the reason behind their anxiety after dinner a large number of their compatriots filed into the room we were begged to stay they evidently wanted us to understand better their suspicion of what england might do in this crisis the longer the talk the more bitter they grew down with england they began to cry indignation and enthusiasm are qualities as contagious as disease before i realized it i shared their anger and was drinking repeatedly in l'eau sucre good mohammedans that our egyptians were they never touched wine drinking repeatedly to loud and angry roars of a bas l'angleterre the egyptians were not only a picturesque and enlivening feature in our life they had a social value which they never suspected we used them rather shamelessly to impress wandering americans who looked with badly concealed scorn on the latin quarter and particularly on our narrow and stuffy rooms a prince was our neighbor we said loftily and to prove it we could show an autographed photograph which the prince on his own notion had given me i kept it on the mantel in the little salon when we felt particular need of asserting ourselves we told of our weekly dinners and they lost nothing of their gaiety and interest in our telling there was so much more flavor in them we always assured those who tried to hi-hat us than ordinary sight-seeing offered i have always felt rather proud of the way we handled ourselves in that year keeping the entire respect of our egyptians it was not always so easy it fell into my awkward hands to handle one rather violent love affair 
a pretty and vivacious young girl had joined our party at the request of her brother will you look after her the egyptians were delighted with her and she treated them as she might a group of american boys could see no reason why she should not go out with them only our combined disapproval our insistence that if she did she soon would be classed in the quarter as little better than the gay little girls who swarmed about and with whom we occasionally out of the corner of our eyes saw our egyptians she must not run that risk but while that was managed the inevitable stir of youth could not be managed and it was not long before i had one of the nicest of the boys begging me on his knees to let him pay his addresses to my little friend insisting that he would marry her never take another wife he wept and pleaded but i held my ground until finally the young girl who loved his suit but not the boy was safely on the ocean a long time afterwards i had proof that we did look after ourselves when a couple of our party were going to italy one of these young men gave them a letter of introduction to an egyptian friend in milan the letter was not presented and not opened until two or three years later when my friend showed me the postscript it read surtout soyez convenable avec ces dames after the egyptians came our french professor a woman of forty buxom competent gay-hearted an able teacher i have never known man or woman more shrewd engaging character or more expert in turning the qualities she found to her own advantage if she respected or admired them she took no more than she gave frequently as in my case much less but if she found a pupil lazy or dishonest or stingy or rich and irresponsible she took mercilessly such people deserve nothing nothing she declared once when i protested she respected me because i worked but she always told me frankly that although i read french easily and wrote it pas mal i should always speak with the detestable english accent no ear too old however i could be made more fluent my vocabulary enlarged my grammar perfected and to that end she bent all her efforts establishing several useful exchange relations the chief of these was her most intimate friend m x a man who i suppose had been for many years her lover m x had no superior intelligence but he was industrious and bon enfant and partly at least through the help of madame a had come to hold an excellent official position she kept him busy in proving his chances at the moment she took me on she had him translating a big volume on the english system of handling the unemployed and the helplessly poor an acute problem for france in the early nineties as she already had pried out of me full information of all i was trying to do she saw at once the possibility of a trade if i would help him in translating he would secure reports and information on subjects in which i was interested it seemed a good thing for me at any rate and the arrangement was made i continued to help with the book until it was published it was well received even couronne by the academy of science to my astonishment i found then that madame a's interest in this book and its success was that it would help her in making a more profitable marriage for m x they had settled on a wife that i knew but as she told me his position was so much improved by the success of his book that he was worth a much larger dot therefore she set out with his help i suppose to find another wife they succeeded and the affair was arranged i was deeply disturbed by the matter i believed as i still do that the only safe basis for a happy marriage is a compound of physical harmony capacity for companionship combined with understanding and acceptance of each other's ideals i could see little chance where it was a matter chiefly of balanced income but madame a had no sympathy with my idealistic attitude towards marriage of course it left her high and dry the little dinners which the three of us had shared almost every week became dinners a deux the first night i was torn with sympathy 
will you never see him again i asked of course not now later perhaps these things arrange themselves mademoiselle but i noticed she ordered a double cognac that night madam a rendered one very great service to our group one which we could never repay we had been but a short time in paris before we realized that one of our duties was to be helping out american girls and women who had come to europe to study a little sightsee a little travel a little expecting easily to form congenial relations with people of the country and who for one reason or another had never been able to do this they were disappointed and unhappy the four of us standing together made a nucleus they envied we made it a rule to do our best to help them out but in at least one case it involved us in serious trouble among those who had attached themselves to us was a woman of some forty or more years with a curiously repellent personality i have never known a person to produce a more melancholy effect on strangers i have seen our little salon empty itself if she dropped in on our evening at home even madame bonnet's little black dog riquet who had adopted us would slink around the edge of the room and beg to be let out if she came in what was the matter we could not imagine more than once she threw herself into my arms and sobbed that she was unhappy in great trouble of which she could not speak miss c had been some three months in the house when we came home from a weekend trip to be met by an outraged madame bonnet miss c she told us had been arrested arrested for stealing at the bon marche in the louvre she was in saint lazare there was a note for me i must do something think of the disgrace to her establishment the note told me only where she was that she had engaged a lawyer asked me to see him i did and found him of the type which i suppose hangs around all prisons into which great cities dump women of the street and petty criminals his only interest was in a possible retainer how much would i pay him for taking the case nothing i assured him until i had talked to the american authorities i went to the consulate where an irate and worried official swore loudly at the faculty of american women for getting into trouble in france here i am he said saddled with a girl who is going to have a baby and who swears she'll kill herself if i don't arrange for her to have it so her family will never know i was afraid she would do it too and then there would be another nasty scandal to hush up so i got the man here and told him he must put up the money to see her through he laughed at me but i pulled this revolver out of the drawer suiting the action to the word and told him i thought i ought to shoot him but that if i didn't i'd send for the girl's brother and see that he did well he settled for ten thousand francs but that does not let me off what am i going to do with the baby and now here you are with one of the nastiest kind of cases for a french court they can't stand foreigners stealing from them but what am i to do i wailed she'll have to stand a public trial you must impress the judges find out if she's got friends get cablegrams show she has relatives willing to help her read her letters see if they don't show what is behind this and when the trial comes have all the pretty girls and prosperous-looking men you know present they'll look at you and they'll think twice put on a campaign woman and so i started out to put on a campaign i began by reading her letters i did not go far before i had the story a tragic one miss c was well born her family prosperous and important in her state she a graduate of a great university she had been a successful teacher was to have been married to a man whom she had loved for years with passion and depth for reasons i never knew the engagement was broken in an attempt to forget patch up her shattered hopes she had come to europe for study and travel but she couldn't forget and every week for months she had written the man long letters and every week they had come back to her unopened her despair became so black that as she told me later i had to do something and so as when one bites on a sore tooth 
she had begun to steal the proofs of it were all there in her room a pathetic collection of articles not worth stealing slipped mainly from bargain counters among them there were at least seventy pairs of gloves of every size and color none of them any one of us would have worn there were some fifty penknives there were a pile of half bolts of ribbon and lace innumerable spools of silk and cotton packages of pins and needles all taken not because she wanted them only to hurt herself in another spot take her mind from the original wound understanding her wretchedness i could sympathize with her folly i began my campaign by telling madame of our trouble she detested miss c thought her crazy though she admitted she was a better pupil than any one of us but here was excitement also an opportunity to serve us what the council had not suggested she did there was a long wait our prisoner was transferred to the conciergerie where i went to see her a gruesome trip under the very windows from which i knew madame roland had looked in the days before she mounted the cart and took her last ride along the quay to the guillotine when the trial came the sympathizing clack was a grand success at madame a's suggestion we dressed for it in the best we had bought new flowers for our hats and fresh gloves brought over two or three handsome young women from the champs elysees quarter as for madame a herself she made a toilette which even a judge would see and hear i had suggested that monsieur x being an important person might impress the judge she was horrified drag a member of the government into such a stupid affair no you americans must do it i'll bring the rich american and she did the rich american was a wealthy idler who for several winters had taken lessons from her largely i think because he found her so pungent and amusing he treated her royally as to fees and kept her in flowers and candy he looked his part of important man of affairs no one could have added more to our display for one could see even the judges eyeing enviously the elegance of his clothes petty larceny cases were at that time and i suppose still are taken into a court-room perhaps forty by twenty with seats for friends and the public on a mounted platform at the end sat three judges in their robes a dossier of each case lay before them they had for our friend a rather impressive collection of documents cablegrams from her family proofs that her father was or had been a man of importance in public affairs her college diploma her check-book and a letter of credit showing her to have ample funds when all was ready seven prisoners were brought in six men half degenerate petty thieves and our poor pale tired friend between them nothing more incongruous could have been seen than this well-dressed woman of evident breeding flanked by these hopeless derelicts after looking over the papers in her dossier the judge looked at her and then at us now paler than she and praying for mercy with eyes and clasped hands they were perplexed and annoyed was there an international angle to the case what are you doing in paris asked one of them harshly studying miss c answered you take a queer way to do it he said tartly why did you do this he asked more gently with a weary shake of her head she said je ne sais pas it was madame a who won the case for it was to her the judges turned as one who they knew at a glimpse talked their language she sailed down the aisle to take her stand before them and i have never seen any one man or woman to whom one could so aptly apply the old figure like a full-rigged ship they let her talk she told how comme il faut we all were as they could see we were important serious rich yes rich then she said candidly this woman is crazy send her home to her friends she had solved their problem told them their duty and they followed her advice adding a fine of five hundred francs and an order that she leave france in a week after her dismissal and never return madame a had saved miss c but she wanted no thanks from her wouldn't see her 
nor would madame bonnet let her come into the house save to gather up her things she had been a fool and got caught to steal the riennes as she had it was a disgrace and respectable people like them could not afford to have her cross their doorways luckily for us our association with american women was not confined to problem cases there was a disturbing number of them compelling me to ask myself again and again if this break for freedom this revolt against security in which i myself was taking part was not a fatal adventure bound to injure the family the one institution in which i believed more than any other bound to produce a terrible crop of wretchedness and abnormality had not even the few successes i saw about me been paid for by a hardening of heart a suppression of natural human joyousness that was uglier even than the case of my poor miss c but i was saved from too much perplexity over what freedom might be doing to my compatriots by a gradual drifting into rather close companionship with a number of americans like ourselves taking lectures at the sorbonne and the college de france it was a great piece of luck for us since these americans were all students of more experience and attainment than any one of us there was dr john vincent of the history department of johns hopkins university and along with him his wife who spent hours of every day making beautiful copies of canvases in the luxembourg there were fred parker emory of the english department of massachusetts institute of technology and his wife there was a younger man charles d hazen a hopkins graduate a man who was to make a distinguished career for himself in french history and now professor emeritus of history at columbia the author of many valuable books serious work did not dull our new friend's curiosity about french life in general nor prevent a humorous detached view of things we were soon dining together every week in restaurants of the quarter into which we had never ventured before here for one franc fifty thirty cents we got a decent dinner vin compris as well as a gay company of students and their girls they were so merry so natural in their gaiety that none of us were anything but amused over their little ways it was in one of these restaurants that for the first time in my life i saw a girl take out a compact straighten her hat her head had been on her cavalier's shoulder and it was out of plumb straighten her hat and powder her nose that the day would come when the manners and customs of the latin quarter of the nineties would be the manners and customs of american girls in practically every rank of life would have been unthinkable to me then our new friends added greatly to the pleasure of the weekly sightseeing excursions which had been one of the features of the plan every weekend go somewhere i had laid down so every saturday we were taking a bateau mouche or train or tram journey costing only a few of our precious sous to st denis the september fete at st cloud versailles if the weather was bad we went to the museums the churches the monuments our new friends liked the idea when spring came our promenades took on a wider range there were weekend trips to fontainebleau and to one after another of the great cathedral and chateau towns chartres beauvais rheims pierrefonds compiegne weekends in company as genial unaffected and intelligent as that of our new friends proved were a rare experience when the time came for a final break-up of the crowd in august of eighteen ninety two my first companions had already gone back to america those left of us decided to take a farewell vacation together the difficulty was to settle on a place here was something not on my schedule we considered etaples beauzeval ulgat belle isle and finally at the last moment took tickets to mont saint michel a glorious spot but after watching the tide come in for two successive days after climbing to the top and descending to the bottom of the chateau sitting out sunsets on the wall and eating omelettes at madame poulard's until we were fed to the full we pushed on to st malo and exhausted it as quickly as we had mont saint michel as we listened bored to the orchestra in the square a poster on a wall suddenly caught our collective eyes it told us to go to the island of jersey with one accord we said let's 
packed our bags, and caught the steamer all within an hour. At Jersey we walked into lodgings, rooms, plenty of them, a salon looking on the sea, such sea fish and vegetables and fruit as only that island offers. We thought it was costing a fortune, but when the bill came, house, housekeeper, maid, and food such as we had not had for a year, it totaled just eighty cents apiece for a day. That vacation put a gay finish on my first year in Paris. I began the second in deep depression, for several good reasons. First, I had exhausted my reserve. I think I came back from my vacation with twenty francs in my pocket. All my American associates were gone, or going soon. I had a new address, for Madame Bonnet had moved from the neighborhood of the Musée Cluny to the more somber neighborhood of the Pantheon. And, hardest of all, I knew now that instead of one year more, I must have at least two to finish my undertaking. The homesickness and hunger for my family had never been appeased. I had lived on their letters. If they did not come regularly, I scolded and wailed. I begged for details of their daily life. My mother was an intimate letter writer, delightfully frank about her neighbors and about the family. She told who was at church, fretted because father spent so much time with his precious Sunday school class of girls, described every new frock, told what they had for Sunday dinner, announced the first green corn in the garden, the blossoming of her pet flowers, snowdrops and primulas and iris in the spring, roses in the summer, anemones in the fall, cactus in the winter. Occasionally she would apologize for her homely details, particularly after I had written a long guidebookish epistle home describing some ancient monument I had been visiting. How I must have bored them sometimes. But home details— I live off them, I told her. You can't tell me too much about your daily doings. This feeling about my family made me a sensitive receiving plate, and accounts, I suppose, for the only proof I personally have ever had of the possibilities in telepathy. This came the first Sunday of June, 1892. I had hardly taken my coffee when I fell prey to a most unaccountable alarm. What it was about, I did not know. I could not work, and finally went to the street. For hours I walked, not able to throw off the black thing that enveloped me. It was late in the afternoon when I returned to find a compatriot with a letter of introduction waiting. As he was leaving the apartment after his call, I picked up my daily copy of Le Temps, and as I always did, turned first to the news from Les Etats Unis. It was to read that the city of Titusville and its neighbor, Oil City, had been utterly destroyed by flood and fire. The only buildings left in my home town were said to be the railroad station and a foundry. A hundred and fifty persons had been drowned or burned to death. The inhabitants had taken to the hills. At that moment my caller came back for his umbrella. I seized him roughly. Read, read. What shall I do? He was a sensible man. Steady, steady, he said. Put on your hat and we'll go out and get other papers. We were soon back with the last editions of all the English and French journals. They all gave space to the disaster, each more distressing and unsatisfactory than the one before. This explains my black day, I told myself. The family is dead, our home gone. It was useless to cable, for the newspapers all spoke of broken communications. But the next morning, as I was dressing, Madame Bonnet came in with a cablegram. Hardly daring to open it, I backed into the corner of the room to feel the support behind me of the walls, while my friend Mrs. Vincent, still with me, watched with white face. The telegram was from my brother, and it had just one word. Safe. When finally a letter came, I found I had justification for my day of horror. For many hours, there had been but little doubt in the minds of my father and brother that the family would have to take to the hills. But they were safe. Our home was standing. The experience left me more nervous than ever about them, and now that my friends had gone, it took all the resolution I could summon to keep my foolish alarms under control. 
although i was beginning my second year with no money in the bank i had friendly relations with two publishing firms that seemed to see a possible something in my work there was scribner's magazine a relation of which i was justly proud not only had they encouraged me about my book but they had asked me to let them consider magazine subjects that interested me and that i was doing but while it was the relation on which i hoped to build serious work in the future at the moment i must share it with something of quicker return and that seemed to be the mcclure syndicate i felt surer of this after my first meeting with its founder s s mcclure that meeting had been just before my vacation in the summer of eighteen ninety two mr mcclure had dropped into paris in the meteoric fashion i found was usual with him and came by appointment to see me at my new address in the rue malbranche this crooked and steep passage off the rue st jacques was unknown to half the cochers of paris but mr mcclure found it and arrived bareheaded watch in hand breathless from running up my four flights eighty steps i've just ten minutes he announced must leave for switzerland to-night to see tyndall a slender figure s s mcclure a shock of tumbled sandy hair blue eyes which glowed and sparkled he was close to my own age a vibrant eager indomitable personality that electrified even the experienced and the cynical his utter simplicity outrightness his enthusiasm and confidence captivated me he was so new and unexpected that practical questions such as would you be interested in articles on and how much will you pay dropped out of mind before i knew it i was listening to the story of his struggle up how as a peddler he had earned money for college who could have let him go without buying his vast schemes of learning undertaken when a freshman at knox college one of which was to study every word in the english dictionary its start its development its present stage its possible future his beautiful romance with hattie his wife the story of the syndicate and of john always john this john that and at last a magazine to be soon and here i was to come in while he talked i was managing somehow to tell him the story of my life and hopes and to fit things together what was to have been ten minutes stretched to two hours or more i must go he suddenly cried could you lend me forty dollars it is too late to get money over town and i must catch the train for geneva certainly i said i had forty dollars there in my desk the sum set aside for my farewell vacation it never occurred to me to do anything but give it to him how queer he said that you should have that much money in the house isn't it i replied it never happened before but i didn't mention the vacation i had some bad moments after he was gone will of the wisp i said a fascinating will of the wisp i'll never see that money he'll simply never think of it again i'll have to give up that vacation serves me right i did see the money promptly for mr mcclure did not forget as i expected him to do but wired his london office that night to send me a check what the new magazine would want from me i gathered in my long and exciting interview with mr mcclure was articles on the achievements of the great french and english scientists not history not literature not politics but science discoveries inventions and adventures here i was back to my college days i found my natural enthusiasm for the physical world and its meanings which professor tingley had directed was not dead only sleeping i found that little as i knew of all these things i still had something of a vocabulary and knew enough to find my way about by hard work there was pasteur there was jansen who was building an observatory on mont blanc there was bertillon the inventor of the system of criminal identification then attracting the attention of the world it took all my courage to talk with these gentlemen but i was soon to find they were the simplest and friendliest of people for two years i kept on hand popular scientific articles whose success depended on interviews with distinguished specialists and in that time i met with only one rebuff and that was a very contemptuous one it was not from a man but from a gifted american woman who was doing valuable special work in one of the great french scientific institutions 
the effect of scholarship on a woman, I told myself. She doesn't ripen, she hardens. I know better now. It happens, but by no means to all women. Take Dr. Florence Sabin, a great human being as well as a great specialist. The contacts I made on this work left me precious memories. There was my acquaintance with Madame and Monsieur Pasteur. One of the first articles Mr. McClure asked for was on the Institute, then but eight years old. Of course, that meant an interview with Pasteur if it could be arranged. It turned out to be easy enough. The Pasteurs lived in a spacious apartment in the Institute. Big rooms with heavy furniture, heavy curtains, dark, soft rugs of the period. It was not until I was actually in the library where Madame Pasteur led me that I realized how sadly Pasteur was crippled by the paralysis of his left side, which he had suffered twenty-five years earlier, after three years of incessant and exhausting labor on the diseases of the silkworm. He moved with difficulty. He hesitated painfully over words. But his eyes were bright, curious, interested. After a few more or less stumbling explanations on my part, we fell to talking naturally. They made it so easy. Mr. McClure was insistent at that moment on what were called human documents, series of portraits of eminent people from babyhood to 1893. I must have a Pasteur series. Monsieur and Madame were delighted with the idea. The old albums were brought out, and the three of us bent over them exactly as we did now and then at home, when the question of WWT at one, SAT at two, IMT at three came up. Again and again they stopped to say, Tiens, voilà Pierre, comment il est drôle. Marie, comme elle est jolie. When the album was closed and we had talked long of his early life, I made an effort to get some idea of what he was thinking of now. But he said, No science. If you want that, go see Monsieur Roux. And so, reluctantly, I went down the stairs that led from the apartment, the kindly old faces watching me, for Monsieur and Madame Pasteur had done me the honor to see me off, and Monsieur kept repeating as I went down, Look out, the stairs are dark. When finally the article came out, in the second issue of McClure's magazine, September 1893, I took a copy to him. He was as pleased as a boy with the pictures. On a later visit he complained that one of his colleagues had carried off the copy. Could I get him another? When I took this to him, it was with the request that he write a maxim for the January 1894 issue of the magazine. Mr. McClure had had the happy idea of asking from leaders of science, industry, religion, literature, a paragraph or two embodying their convictions as to the outlook for the world's future, their hopes for it. There was need enough of encouragement. The world had been going through as bad a year as often comes its way, a year of despair, uncertainty, hopelessness. What was ahead? The replies, which filled eighteen pages of the magazine, included letters and sentiments from Huxley, Tyndall, Max Muller, Henry Stanley, Julia Ward Howe, Cardinal Gibbons, and a score of others. Noble collection. It was published under the heading The Edge of the Future. It raised my interest in the venture to a high pitch of enthusiasm. It was for me the spirit, the credo of the new magazine. It meant something more than I had dreamed possible in magazine journalism. For the Edge of the Future undertaking, I was asked at a last moment to collect all the sentiments I could from distinguished Frenchmen. Pasteur certainly, and he was easy. Of course I will do it, he said. Come back and I'll have it ready. But when I went back I found him in a flurry. He had written his pensée, and it was lost. Never mind, comforted Madame Pasteur. She'll come back when you have it ready for her. And so I did, but it was unfinished, and Madame Pasteur had to stand over him, encouraging him with tender très bien and little pats while he wrote. He was peevish as a child. He didn't like the looks of it, tried again, and finally, with a pathetic look, said, I'm afraid you don't want either, but if you do, take your choice. And so I did. What he had written was, in the matter of doing good, 
Obligation ceases only when power fails. Before the time limit was up, I had autographed sentiments from Alphonse Daudet, Zola, Alexandre Dumas, Francois Coppé, and Jules Simon, as veil as a collection of impressions still clear. There was Zola. I carried away from my visit with him an impression of a man agitated, confused, sulky, an impression emphasized by the amazing conglomeration of furnishings of all ages and all countries which cluttered the entry stairway and big salon of his house i had to wind my way between suits of armor sedan chairs chinese lacquered tables and seats carved and painted wood to reach him standing at the end of the room the whole house was like that as is shown in a series of sketches mcclure published in one of the early numbers he talked long and violently about his enemies defended his realism hinted that he was a latter-day balzac also a great collector spending his leisure in paris at art sales which accounted for my difficulty in finding him in his own salon the sentiment he gave me was a reflection of his talk and of the point of view of his school war he wrote is the very life the law of the world how pitiful is man when he introduces ideas of justice and of peace when implacable nature is only a continual battlefield dumas fille was the only serene person in the group and was very courteous the quietest frenchman i ever met jules simon touched me deeply by what he wrote faire le bien récolter l'ingratitude c'est confier à dieu end of chapter six part two Chapter Seven of All in the Day's Work by Ida Tarbell. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. A first book on nothing certain a year. Now that McClure's was really started, I felt that on what I could do for them and the two or three articles in which I had interested Scribner's, I could live, and that I might drop everything else and devote the bulk of my time to my real business, a study of the life of Madame Roland she had never been out of my mind soon after my arrival i had found to my joy that my daily walks to and from the national library where i was spending most of my time could be laid through the very quarter in which her father had carried on his trade of goldsmith and past the house in which she had been born the church where she had taken her first communion the prison where she had spent her last days along the route she followed to the guillotine what luck what luck i used to say that i should be taking the very walk she took it was amazing how little things had changed the house where madame roland was born still stands at the western point of the ile de la cite looking down on the statue of henry the fourth and the busy seine and to my right the pont neuf in her day the heart of paris and still to me one of its most fascinating spots as she slowly came to life something more important began to take shape something which had been little more than a series of dates and events in my mind i began to see the revolution already well on its way when she was born i saw it rising around her sucking her in using her when she thought it had gone far enough and should check its excesses throwing her over without her head while true to type it went the whole way finally falling exhausted into the hands of a dictator equipped with guns the physical scars of all this long train of violence could be seen on my daily walks or studying in the musee carnavalet where paris has gathered documents and relics of what she has destroyed as well as of what she has achieved but besides the scars of madame roland's time were other scars dating from the centuries scars of revolutionary outbreaks of the same type hardly to be distinguished from those of the period i was trying to visualize and the more you knew of these explosions the more they seemed to fit together you could not bound madame roland's revolution as i had supposed what i had called the french revolution was only an unusually violent episode in the lifelong struggle of paris to preserve herself as a free individual the slave of no man or group of men 
revolution had always been her last resort in making herself what she was in forcing kings to do her bidding tolerating them when they fed her well beautified her protected her but throwing them over when they asked too much money for the job they did the marks were all over the city how could i understand madame roland until i understood the elemental force which for centuries had been sweeping paris in big or little gusts did these who sought to loosen the force suppose that they created it or could control it once loosened had madame roland confident as she had been of her ability to act as providence frank as she was in saying that no role but that of providence was suited to her powers been anything more than a revolutionary tool and victim it had always been at work and still was i must find out about it and it looked at the moment as if i were going to have a good opportunity to watch a revolutionary revival of what proportions no man could tell the panama affair had disgusted all self-respecting frenchmen is the republic to be a failure they were asking nothing so gives heart to the leaders of lost causes disappointed political groups advocates of panaceas and particularly to the radical-minded as a rousing political scandal panama stirred all the parties of france to action bourbons and bonapartists extreme conservatives socialists of all the many varieties and particularly the anarchists there were four groups of the latter no one of which would have anything to do with any of the others it was the independents who now went into action members of this group worked alone letting not even their fellows know what they had in mind a branch of the order existed in the united states and it was one of them alexander berkman who attempted this same year eighteen ninety two to assassinate henry frick in pittsburgh the independent who acted first in paris was jules ravachol by name a man some thirty-three years old a dyer by trade with a courageous but not a criminal face so i thought when a little later i secured his photograph and measurements from the criminal identification bureau for mcclure's magazine ravachol began by blowing up various houses it was like a toxin all over france similar outrages followed and they continued at intervals for two or more years the crowning one a bomb thrown in the chamber of deputies in december of eighteen ninety three by a notorious anarchist known as auguste vaillant several deputies and eighty or more spectators in the gallery were wounded seriously it was a ghastly affair the outbreaks and the rumors of outbreaks as well as the actual destruction had a bad effect on the nerves of many of the french there was alphonse daudet madame daudet had offered to get me a pensee for the collection i was making for mcclure's magazine and arranged for me to call for the copy after we had tea she took me to the library to see how alphonse was getting on it was my first glimpse of him a little man with a shock of straight black hair which stood out rather ferociously at the moment evidently from running his fingers through it his face was pale his eyes astonishingly black and bright he had lost two or three teeth and the remaining ones were not very good he was terribly excited he had not finished his pensee he said because he had just had a visit from an anarchist the servant had let in a man who had demanded twenty francs to buy a wagon-load of dynamite to blow up the hotel de ville he grew more and more excited as he talked i really expected the man to kill me he said and i got out this revolver which i always keep in the drawer and he pulled it out to show it to me a pretty affair he said if while you two were visiting in there a tragedy had gone on in here i so shared the general nervousness that more than once when i saw a man on the omnibus carrying a package i feared a bomb and abruptly descended yet along with all my nervousness i was always nosing around hoping to see a bomb go off it seemed to me that that was my journalistic duty but i never saw anything more than the ruins they had caused i did see a pretty good revolution one that had all the earmarks that I had been finding in my attempted study of revolution. It was in July of 1893. 
this time it was youth in revolt the youth of the latin quarter and the beaux-arts from start to finish the revolt went on practically under my windows the annual ball of the beaux-arts in the winter of eighteen ninety three had scandalized paris as i remember the exhibit which outraged was a lady who promenaded with no other covering than a mosquito net the protest finally reached the chamber of deputies where a member beranger took it up in a serious way and proposed a restrictive law which angered the students it was they said an interference with their right to amuse themselves immediately long and picturesque monomes single lines of men one hand on the shoulder of the man in front the other grasping a hand of the one behind threaded their way up and down the boulevards particularly in the vicinity of the luxembourg chanting at the top of their voices conspoe berger conspoe Lowe's, chief of police down with the puritans the demonstration began on a saturday and that night a great crowd centred in a cafe in my neighbourhood the place was packed inside and out with youths noisier and noisier as the hours went on finally the crowd became so unruly that a squadron of police charged them there was a great hubbub and in the melee somebody hurled one of the heavy white match boxes which were used on all the tables in the latin quarter restaurants a dangerous missile it hit an innocent spectator who had come to see the fun a young man of twenty-two or twenty-three from the other side of the river and killed him the students were wild with rage and all that night and all next day they tore up and down the streets pulling up trees knocking over kiosks breaking windows the shopkeepers of paris having the experience of centuries of revolutionary outbreaks behind them knew when to retire and before monday night the heavy wooden shutters with which they protect their fronts were all up the doors closed and the quarter was alive with soldiers and mounted police the centre of the disturbance that day however was not the latin quarter but the streets around the chamber of deputies where a great band of angry students kept up a tumult there were funny incidents a big group of deputies came out to look over the demonstration and on the instant the air rang with the jingling of hundreds of big copper sous pitched on the pavements to cries of panama panama the dahomeans were pets of paris in those days a picturesque addition to the population handsomer creatures never were seen it happened a carriage full naked to the waist attempted to pass through the crowd at once the students set up the cry beranger beranger bring him a fig leaf bring him a fig leaf by tuesday the latin quarter had begun to look sinister the inevitable had happened a popular disturbance never remains long in the full control of those who start it advocates of all sorts of systems and causes join it seize it if one of them can produce a real leader a student's revolt can easily become an anarchist raid with looting and arson on the side by professional lawbreakers who always come out of their hiding places when anarchy breaks out as the to be expected invasion of the latin quarter from without began destruction increased omnibuses were seized and at strategic points piled up as barricades but the rioters never succeeded in making a stand steadily and quietly night and day platoons of mounted police moved up and down the boulevards and into the quarter i tried at first to go on my usual round hoping to learn something of revolutionary technique but after i had been caught in a crowd the cavalry was driving from the place de la sorbonne had heard bullets whistling over my head had been forced to take refuge in the portal of the church i was content to stay at home however there was excitement enough there our street was narrow and steep when the cavalry charged it would fill up with the rioters the movement was amazingly quiet no shouting no shots the only noise the clatter of the horses feet as they drove the mass ahead the invasion of our street produced panic among the foreigners in the house there were a couple of middle-aged american women on the floor below me outseeing the world but they had not bargained for a revolution 
and during the three or four days our revolution was going on they shut themselves night and day in their room the egyptians were in a worse panic they whispered horrible stories of what happened in revolutions and one night when fires had been set in our neighborhood and the firemen were out they were sure we were all going to be burned alive here we are fourth floor cried one of them too high up to get out we'll all be dead by morning a week was as long as the students could hold out in the torrid weather there were too many cavalry too many soldiers to alert a police force and also there were the apaches the anarchists it was no longer their revolution they gave up and by the end of the week kiosks were replaced trees replanted windows and doors opened and we were all going on in our normal way over all quiet nevertheless it was a pretty fine little revolution while it lasted was it not like ravachol and vaillant a symptom the kind of symptom by which the rise of the revolutionary fever always announces itself were there those who would nourish these symptoms as carefully as madame roland and her friends had nourished them in her day if so you would get your explosion and for what good i was asking myself madame roland had lost her head because she was not content with the first revolution which had given the country a constitution she wanted to get the king and queen and the highborn of all varieties out of the way she wanted a republic she lost her head to those who were not satisfied with getting king and queen out of the way who wanted her and her followers out of the way as soon as they began to cry for order her republic had collapsed under napoleon bonaparte there had come a return to the bourbon then a republic then a return to a bonaparte and again her republic but was this corrupt and vulgar republic i was hearing about any better than the corrupt and scandalous court she hated and helped overthrow was the affair of the diamond necklace any worse than the affair of panama was the bastille a more ghastly prison than the spot where they were now sending political prisoners the devil's island of the tropics i did not have the consolation of a fixed political formula to pull me out of my muddle it is very easy to put everything in its place when you have that and are armed with its faith and its phrases but here was i with a heroine on my hands whose formula and methods and motives i was beginning to question as i was questioning the formula the methods and motives of france of the moment what kept me at my task prevented me from throwing up madame roland and going on a blind research for the nature and roots of revolution was the brilliant and friendly intellectual circle into which my quest of madame roland had led me among the names i had been advised to include in my series on the writing women of paris was that of a mary f robinson an englishwoman of the pre-raphaelite school a poetess of delicacy and distinction who had married one of the eminent scholars of france james darmestetter a hebrew and a cripple one only had to look into his face to know that here was a great soul and what interested me so was that this something in his face his remarkable head wiped out all sense of incongruity between the mating of this slender and exquisite woman with this man of alien race and crippled body i never felt for a moment an incongruity when Monsieur Darmestetter learned I was after Madame Roland, he was immediately helpful. You must know Léon Marillier of the École des Hautes Etudes. He is a great-great-grandson of Madame Roland. He has papers which have never been given to the public. I will write you a letter. Which he did, a letter which brought me an invitation to dinner. This dinner was the gate to a whole new social and intellectual world here was a french academic household of the best sort simple hard-working gay leon marillier was an excellent and respected scholar jeanne his wife a sister of the breton poet anatole Bras, was not only a skilful household manager but like the wives of many french scholars her husband's amanuensis copy and proofreader and general adviser she had particular charm among parisians for she was a breton who loved her pays and kept its distinguishing marks without being provincial 
here i found too eager to go over the papers which leon maridier spread out after dinner for my inspection one who was to prove a most helpful and delightful friend charles bourgo the eminent swiss scholar a friend of my friends the vincents now back at johns hopkins but this was not the end of it there was a closer connection leon maridier's mother the great-granddaughter of madame roland and they quickly passed me on to her here again i was invited to dinner and here i discovered a circle different from anything i had ever known a household of brilliant men presided over by madame marillier a most gracious woman of fine intelligence freed and mellowed by a tragic life as i was to learn more than any woman i have ever known madame marillier came to stand in my mind and heart as the personification of that quality which the french hold so high bonté the leader of the group of men was a sorbonne professor of history charles seignobos he was a learned man who carried his learning not as an accomplishment but as a social utility seignobos was a not too dogmatic socialist and materialist a good pianist a marvellous talker a lovable and pungent personality around him there gathered every wednesday evening for dinner at madame marillier's table a number of young men all serious students liberal minds hard workers after dinner six or eight more habitues of the house were sure to drop in for coffee and for talk among these regular habitues was lucien Eyre who at that moment was seeking to convert to socialism the two men who in the years since have done most to make the doctrine an impregnable factor in political life in france jean jaurès and leon blum the recent premier of france Eyre at that time was the librarian at the Ecole normale as well as the managing editor of the revue de paris in both positions he met many young would-be scholars and writers when one of them seemed to him to have the makings of a liberal thinker he worked over him as a missionary works to save a soul he was so working in the early nineties over jean jaurès and leon blum occasionally lucien Eyre brought to the seignobos circle one of those whom he was seeking to convert if jaurès and blum were ever among them they made no particular impression on me much as i dislike to think so they were simply a couple of lucien's young men although Eyre believed the socialistic state he sought would and could come by a peaceful evolution the thing i remember best about him was an exhibit of indifference to bloodshed which shocked me to the core the night that feant threw the bomb in the chamber of deputies the group was dining with madame marillier lucien was late not an unusual happening we were halfway through when he came in pale exalted we all turned in our seats as he standing told us how he had been in the chamber when the bomb was thrown of the explosion in mid-air of the wounded all about him he had no word of the suffering only of the political bearings of the deed but the wounded lucien broke in senor Bos, who could not endure the thought of pain c'est là ne me fait rien said lucien his opposition to bloodshed was intellectual not emotional like that of seignobo on the face of it nobody could have been less at home in such a group than i a tongue-tied alien all eyes and ears contributing nothing but my presence yet it came out before many weeks that mademoiselle miss as seignobos called me had a place at the weekly dinners undoubtedly the friendship that sprang up quickly between madame marillier and me as well as the fact that i asked nothing but to listen explained it i could afford to listen i had never heard such talk there was nothing on earth that was foreign or forbidden opinions were free as the air but they had to fight for their lives there was a complete absence of pretense and sophistry was thrown as soon as it came to its feet that it was a friendly circle its acceptance of me was proof enough friendliness began at the door when i arrived wednesday evening it was always seignobos who came rushing to meet me seized my hand helped me off with my wraps danced about me asking eager boyish questions about what i had been doing since i was there last 
the talk begun i was forgotten unless by chance he suddenly recalled me then he would jump up run over demand what do you think of that half the time i was thinking less about what they were saying than about their exciting personalities they seemed to be vividly related to life but much of their talk was based on something that was not life abstract literature learning speculation i realized this when they talked of america senobos saw it only as he had read about it in books it seemed to him not to be producing that intellectual elite on which he felt the salvation of society depended a group capable of doing the thinking and planning for a world of lesser men it was the lesser men who were coming to the top in america confronted with superiority from america he refused to believe it native one summer i presented to him a friend of mine a woman of exquisite mind and manner she is not american he said they do not produce that kind in america where was she born where was she educated in kansas i said he bounded out of his chair like a ball it couldn't be it couldn't be kansas is only a half-settled state one has only to look to see that this is a rare type that you have brought here she never came out of kansas i never saw him more outraged than one day when pressure was brought to bear on him to accept a position in the university of chicago at a handsome salary jumping up he raced around the room chicago what can a man of intelligence find there you can't build an intellectual center on money and organization it is a growth five hundred years from now chicago may be fit for scholars but not now he mistrusted the intelligence of the united states but less than that of england americans were not stupid englishmen were he wanted none of them in his circle i met this prejudice head-on when i asked permission to introduce him to a brilliant young english friend h wickham steed i had never known a young man who was sure of what he wanted to do in life or who was preparing for it in a more thorough and logical fashion than steed his ambition was to become a foreign correspondent of the london times he knew that for this it was necessary for him to be familiar with the languages the history the men the politics of the leading countries of the continent he began by taking some two years in germany now he was acquainting himself with the french language literature politics leaders i found steed especially interesting on a subject of which i knew little although we were having reverberations of it in the united states this was the philosophy of karl marx steed was familiar with its then status in germany knew its leaders liebknecht and engels he envied me my relations with the group at madame marillier's envied me my wednesday night dinner as he might very well could you not present me he asked i knew how jealous they were of their circle and knew too they thought the english a stupid bigoted race and wanted none of it but steed was certainly not stupid besides he was young and i had the feeling that nothing would be better for him than contact with these enlightened friends of mine and so with some hesitation i told senobos about him and asked him if i might bring him never the english are stupid you are wrong about steed i argued you ought to be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt after some arguments i was allowed to present my protege as i expected they pounced on him mercilessly it was fine to see the way he held his own and a relief when after an hour or more of baiting senubos came to my corner and in a tone of surprise and wonder said mademoiselle mees your englishman is intelligent when they came to that conclusion they took steed in and from that time on he was welcome all through the years of his brilliant career as a correspondent and later through the war as foreign editor of the london times the association with senubos continued in his recollections through thirty years steed tells of his introduction to the circle a sort of entrance examination which convinced his examiners he was less stupid than he ought to have been this then was the group in which my interest in madame roland had landed me as the weeks went on the intimacy grew greater 
whatever occurred to them that might help me in my work they suggested it was through their introduction that i was given every opportunity in the manuscript room of the national library to work over the large collection of roland manuscripts which had just been catalogued indeed i was the first person to work on them in the library delightful as well as important to my enterprise was the invitation madame gave me in the spring of eighteen ninety three to go with her for a fortnight to les clos a country estate which had been in the roland family for at least a hundred years before the revolution after the death of monsieur and madame roland in seventeen ninety three les clos had passed to their daughter it now belonged to madame mardier who managed it giving special care to its chief yield, grapes, made into wine on the place. Le Clos lay in the Beaujolais, some thirty miles north of the city of Lyon, and close to a hamlet called Thézé. Here Madame Roland had spent some four years while her husband served as inspector of the manufactures at Lyon. The chateau was little changed, so Madame Mardier told me. The activities were what they had been a hundred years ago it was a rare chance to see my heroine in a different role busy with other duties than those of student tuft hunter political diplomat providence to a nation i needed to see her in a more natural and helpful environment for i was beginning to mistrust her the journey to le clos with madame maradier taken in may was an adventure for both of us how much she had jeopardized her position in her own family by travelling with a foreigner and a protestant i did not realize until the day we spent sightseeing at dijon she left me for an hour to visit an important and ancient aunt i should not dare take you with me she said my aunt would cast me out if she knew i was travelling with a heretic to reach le clos we left the railroad at villefranche and climbed in a horse-cart for an hour or more steadily up hills across valleys a high broad country striped by many coloured ribbon-like farms dotted by stout buildings of dull yellow the stone of the country sprinkled with splendid trees vineyards and orchards tisé the hamlet we sought lay high we drove between its walls turned into a lane and stopped before a big gate in a yellow wall behind it lay le clos a little white chateau of louis the fourteenth's time with corner towers and red-tiled roofs a court on one side a garden on the other from this garden one looked out over a magnificent panorama of hills mountains valleys stretching to the swiss alps in the east on clear evenings the snow-caps were visible and now and then the round crown of mont blanc glowed on the skyline like an immense opal within the chateau there had been little outward change from madame roland's time there was the same great dark kitchen with its stone floor its huge fireplace although now a stove helped out the same shining copper vessels on the walls there was the same brick floor in the billiard room with its ancient table its guns and caps of successive generations of soldiers on the walls the brightest place within the house was the salon done in yellow plush family portraits on the walls a piano books i had an apartment to myself looking out on the garden and beyond to the mountains a bedroom toilet and workroom severe as a nun's cell with its uncovered floor its unadorned walls but containing every necessary comfort and a wealth of books five hundred or more in my workroom including several magnificent sets among them voltaire complete in seventy volumes they nearly all bore eighteenth-century dates and some of them the name of roland himself indeed the home was rich in books of value in madame marillier's library there were two thousand or more but these were only what was left from the collection she had inherited she had given leon marillier complete early sets of voltaire rousseau diderot she had made a collection of scientific books for louis lapique one of the members of her paris household and another of historical books for charles seignobot and still there were all these hundreds many of which i had the right to believe madame roland herself had handled we ransacked them for marginal notes and hunted through the drawers of old desks and bureaus for papers finding not a few small bits which were grist for my mill 
books were about all the original possessions of leclos that the revolutionists of the seventeen nineties had not made away with the chateau itself had not suffered seriously though there were still some slight scars but books aside it had been completely stripped of furnishings even today so madame marillier told me it was not unusual when inquiry was made about the origin of some interesting old piece in a beaujolais farmhouse to be told oh that came from leclos a hundred years ago the revolution stripped leclos of its possessions and all but ended the family but it did not succeed in convincing all the beaujolais of its beneficence there was not a little outspoken anti-revolutionary feeling still abroad the marseillaise was never played in tizé i was told the cure and the municipal council would not permit it nor would they allow the fourteenth of july to be celebrated while i was at leclos there was a sharp dispute in a neighboring hamlet on the plain of the marseillaise the bandmaster refused to lead when it was asked it was put up to the band who voted yes thereupon the master lay down his baton and went off in a huff madame roland's revolution was not ended but i did not think much of such dark matters at leclos they did not belong to the years i had come there to relive those were only gay happy useful years i knew from her letters before me she could and did fill the role of a local providence adjusting her activities and reforms to what her constituency understood and was willing to accept she filled her time as i saw my friend madame marillier filling hers busy from morning until night with the affairs of the estate visiting the people prescribing remedies for man and beast vegetables and vines arranging a marriage for this pair making an invalid more comfortable taking care of some peasant's wayward son climbing up the steep hillside to early mass to set a good example discharging naturally and intelligently that responsibility to the family the estate the dependent countryside which the frenchwoman seems to accept as her contribution to the state it makes her something steady wise superior a strong factor in the economic social and religious stability of france i had never seen anything which seemed to me more useful than what madame marinier was doing and i had opportunity to judge for everywhere she went she took me with her her invariable card of introduction to these natural-born sceptics of the value of all persons not born and raised in france was mademoiselle comes from the same country as your vines that was enough for them their vines had been devastated by repeated visitations of the phylloxera and it was not until the introduction of american roots that the vineyards had recovered they were looking well now i was welcome at once they treated me as if i were the benefactor yet i doubt if any of them knew where america was most of them with whom i talked placed it somewhere in africa africa they did know as a name at least because many of their sons went there for military service one of the most surprising things to me among the french high and low was their utter indifference to the geography of the rest of the world why should they bother about the rest of the world there was only one land about which they should know that was france and that they should know to the last corner even many educated people i met did not distinguish north from south america in madame darmestetter's drawing-room i met cultivated people who believed that all americans carried weapons in their pockets and that indians walked the streets of chicago when i protested that it was against the law to carry a revolver and that the only indians in chicago were those that were imported as they imported the dahomans they smiled incredulously many of them i concluded got their notions of what america was like from the exhibits in a certain public hall on the grand boulevard here you paid a sou or two to look through stereoscopes at amusing and sometimes very improper pictures here the walls were decorated with illustrated newspapers from different countries and among them were always copies of the police gazette 
as a matter of fact it was in this hall of the grand boulevard of paris that i saw the first copy of the police gazette that i had seen since those days back in rouseville when my friend and i carefully studied the underworld in the sheets that we could slip away from the bunkhouse of my father's workmen the visit to le clos with its grist of impressions the conviction that i had seen madame roland herself in her happiest as well as her most useful days completed the study of source material for her life on which i had been working as i found time through the twenty months i had been in paris it rounded out the woman she was softened the asperity which i was beginning to feel for her also it strengthened my suspicion that while a woman frequently was a success as the providence of a countryside she did no better than a man when she attempted to fill that function for a nation now i was ready to write my book of course while i was doing this i must keep the wolf from the door and it was not so easy in the year eighteen ninety three for a stray journalist in paris to get out of the distracted american market orders or pay for orders the depression of the nineties now in its third year with five more to go was working havoc everywhere it was hard to get your money even if your debtors consented you had earned it i was depending at the moment largely upon the new magazine mcclure's it had started in the summer of eighteen ninety three an undertaking which only the young and innocent and the hopelessly optimistic would ever have dared it has always been a marvel to me that mr mcclure and mr phillips were able to hold on through that dreadful year but they did and with a resourcefulness even gaiety that nobody but those who saw it can appreciate i knew perfectly well that if the magazine lived i should get all the money i earned but in the summer of eighteen ninety three they did not have it it came to a serious pass with me a point where i did not have a sou or anybody to whom i could confide my predicament not for the world would i have told my devoted madame marillier that there was no money in my purse not for the world would i have confided it to madame a and as for the americans on the scene i was bent on impressing them with the fact i was really getting on at all events it must not go back to titusville or meadville pennsylvania that this questionable venture of mine had brought me so low and so one warm summer day i took my sealskin coat which really was a very good one quite out of keeping with the rest of my wardrobe by this time close to scandalous i took the coat and marched over town to the mont de piete they were polite to me but i was a foreigner the coat might be stolen probably was what credentials did i have whom could i give as reference there was nobody in the town that i was willing to have know what i was doing but did i have documents to prove my identity yes i said i had and i would bring them so i left my coat and raced back to the left bank for my credentials and what were they what did i have there were letters from my publishers there was my check-book exhausted but nevertheless a check-book without thinking it would be of any particular use i took my allegheny college diploma the inspector passed lightly over the letters of editors the stubs in my check-book but the diploma impressed him and so it was on my allegheny college diploma i made the loan which helped me over the bad months of eighteen ninety three while i was waiting for a check from a land in the grip of one of the most serious money famines that it had ever known although there might be anxious moments over money i was freer to work on my book than i had ever been and work i did as hard as i could all that terrifically hot summer my friend madame marillier had gone to brittany she begged me to come along but i had used up all my vacation money in my trip to le clos a trip i had extended to switzerland and a chain of french towns where there were beautiful things i wanted to see to bourg masson cluny autun there was nothing that i wanted to do more except finish up and go home but the finishing up was not so easy i had undertaken the study of this woman in order to clear up my mind about the quality of service that women could give and had given in public life particularly in times of stress i had hoped to come out with some definite conclusions to be able to say the woman at this point will be a steady intuitive dependable force 
she will never lend herself to purely emotional or political approaches to great social problems she knows too much of human beings her business has always been handling human beings building families has been her job in society you can depend upon her to tell you whom to trust whom to follow whom to discard these intuitions of hers about people are born of centuries of intimate first-hand dealing with human beings from babyhood on they are among the world's greatest values and she will be no party to violence she knows that solutions are only worked out by patient cooperation and that cooperation must be kindly she knows the danger of violence in the group as she knows the danger of selfishness she has been the world's greatest sufferer from these things and she has suffered them in order that she might protect the thing which is her business in the world the bearing and the rearing of children she has a great inarticulate wisdom born of her experience in the world that is the thing women will give that was what i had hoped to find madame roland giving and i had found a politician with a providence complex i had also found what i had been trying to shove aside as women do new proof of that eternal and necessary natural law that the woman backs up her man madame roland had been royalist republican revolutionist according to the man she loved she had served her man with unyielding conviction would not temper or cooperate intolerant but what woman in america seeking the vote as a sure cure for injustice and corruption would listen to such a message that of course was no affair of mine my affair was clearing my own mind so far i had only succeeded in adding to its confusion even in destroying faiths i had held there was the ancient faith that you could depend upon the woman to oppose violence this woman had been one of the steadiest influences to violence willing even eager to use this terrible revolutionary force so bewildering and terrifying to me to accomplish her ends childishly believing herself and her friends strong enough to control it when they needed it no longer the heaviest blow to my self-confidence so far was my loss of faith in revolution as a divine weapon not since i discovered the world not to have been made in six days of twenty-four hours each had i been so intellectually and spiritually upset i had held a revolution as a noble and sacred instrument destroying evil and leaving men free to be wise and good and just now it seemed to me not something men used but something that used men for its own mysterious end and left behind the same relative proportion of good and evil as it started with never did i realize my ignorance of life and men and society as in the summer of eighteen ninety four when i packed up the manuscript of my life of madame roland to take it back to america for its final revision in the peace of my home of course i told myself i would go through with it i would put down what i had found as nearly as i could even if it had not got what i came for and then came the question can i get what i came for is it to be found the real answer to my question about woman in society the point or position where she can best serve it can i find an answer to this other question that has so disturbed me the nature of revolution apparently i told myself as i packed my bag finally to go back to america you have only begun but at least you have a new starting point cheer up make a new plan and i was making a new plan i had been making one for some time it was laid down economically professionally and socially with as much precision as the plan with which i had come to paris in eighteen ninety one it was a plan for my return to paris i would go home get my book into shape try to convince the scribners that it was worth their publishing i would get a good long visit with my family the only thing i felt now to be worth while in life i wanted to be sure they were there that the house was there that my father's chair stood by the living-room centre table under the drop gas reading light that the family sunday dinner was what it had always been i wanted to hear my father ask the blessing at the table to sit with my sister and mother afternoons out on the shady side of the lawn i wanted all the home flowers i could gather 
and it was queer what a big place flowers took in my dreams of home my mother was one of those women for whom they say anything will grow and she had flowers summer and winter one of the deprivations of not having money in paris had been that i could not buy flowers i had to content myself with lounging around the flower markets on the square of notre dame i lingered there almost as much as i did over the bookstalls along the seine but at home i could gather all i wanted i would come back to france on different terms my friendly publishers would give me work i had schemes for books and articles which i felt sure would interest the scribners that history of women for instance then there was this lively friendly aggressive delightful mcclures there were plenty of things i could write for them i would take up an apartment in the latin quarter up high where i could look over the roofs see the sky i would have a salon like madame marillier's she would find me a bonne tout faire and i could have people into dinner madame marillier seigneur Bosse, and perhaps lucien air and louis la pique and charles borgo would come the summer would bring over my precious american friends the vincents emery's hazens and my sister must join me life would be full and satisfying while i cleared up my mind on women and revolution and continued my search for god in the great cathedrals it was with this baggage and a terrible thirst for a long drink of family life that in june eighteen ninety four i said au revoir to my friends i felt so sure it was au revoir the first two months after i reached america i spent at home convincing myself that my family in spite of the trials it had been suffering was unchanged in its ways its loyalties and its philosophy if life was not as easy materially for my father and mother as their long years of labor and self-denial gave them the right to hope i found that they were enjoying that most precious experience the evidence of the continuity of their lives my brother and his fine wife with their children two girls and a boy lived only a few doors away and the grandchildren were as much in one home as in the other they gave i found a continual fresh zest to the household and its doings my father again had the legitimate excuse for going to the circus which our growing up had taken from him the children want to go my mother had as strong a justification for family picnics and birthday celebrations on which she tired herself out the children enjoy them so for me those children were a challenging experience three years had made the youngsters keen observers and i found them appraising me in the fashion of natural unspoiled children launched on one of the long narrative monologues to which i am addicted with intimates i would suddenly be checked by the cool impersonal stare of nieces or nephew they did not know they were doing it but i knew they were taking my measure they were not only an unending interest and joy to me but a salutary correction as they have continued to be to this day but before i was really sure of my standing with them though quite reassured as to that with their elders and just as i had put the finishing touches to my madame roland i was snatched away from titusville by a hurried letter from mr mcclure i must come at once to new york and write a life of napoleon bonaparte End of chapter 7